Hello everyone uh, and welcome to this event. Uh, we need to start on time because we have an audience out in the world with us today since we are streaming this event. Uh, but special welcome to our master students here at the Department of Musicology because this is also a class for them uh, that we are now taking over for this uh, special occasion. Uh, my name is Alessandra Jansenius. I'm director of RITMO, Center for Interdisciplinary Studies of Written Time and Motion. And um, that's a collaborative center here at the University of Oslo that I will shortly introduce in a little while. But first, the agenda for today. So I will give a, a brief introduction to RITMO and to the concept of Music Lab. And then we'll have a keynote lecture by Ian Cross from the University of Cambridge, uh, who will reflect a little bit on some of the topics that we are dealing with here today. Then we'll have a short break, and then we'll have the launch of the special collection uh, in the journal Music and Science, that is also edited by Ian Cross. Uh, and in this special collection, we have multiple articles that will be presented by Simon Höfting, sitting here, and uh, that in various ways sum up uh, results from the Music Lab Copenhagen. Oh, uh, which we also have a member of the quartet sitting back there that you will uh, meet later on in the panel discussion with some, uh, also some researchers. So that's today's program. And if you manage to, be, uh, to follow all of this and uh, are here in person, you will have a reception with food, uh, etc. outside uh, at the end of this. And for those of you out in the world, uh, no food for you, but you are very welcome anyways. Um, of course, for people here in the hall, if you have questions and things along the way, we, we, we can take them here in person. But uh, for those of you out in the world, you can type your questions and comments in the chat and we'll try to monitor those along the way. Well, that's the introduction part. The emergency exits are there and there and the toilets are out in the corridor. And if you do need coffee, we also have a little bit of coffee outside. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, we have a center here at the University of Oslo, uh, which is a so-called center of excellence. Um, and the aim of RITMO is to understand um, uh, more about the concept of written as a fundamental property of human life. And uh, Music Lab uh, and the various Music Labs that we've had have also explored this topic in various ways. So RITMO is composed of researchers from musicology, and we are currently in the Department of Musicology, but also psychology and informatics. And um, RITMO is physically located uh, on the other side of campus. So if we are here now in the musicology department, then you can cross campus up there, and then uh, we are in the psychology building up there. And we also have people from informatics also that are physically also co-located then at RITMO. So, uh, as I said, the topic of RITMO is written in various ways, and we like to say that we study this from many different perspectives, from the soft to the hard. And, well, soft then would be more humanities approaches, reading and writing books, but also various types of musicological approaches by, uh, with sound of various kinds, also digital sound. Then we are working more on different types of uh, interview techniques, questionnaires. We move into the behavioral domain with motion capture, eye tracking, pupillometry, various types of brain imagery, uh, machine learning, and also some robotics. So it's a quite large palette of different things. And we have even expanded a little bit into microbiology in recent years as well, on top of everything else. Now, we're going to explain a lot about how we are organized at RITMO, but just to give you a kind of sense of the different things that we're working on, these are the clusters of the gravitational points we have within RITMO. And just to give you some very short examples of some, some questions that some of our researchers are working on, uh, one on rap, uh, also something more on the, how the pupils respond to, uh, to music. Robots, of course, how we can deal with them, build them, and have them work in different ways. And uh, also, and a question like this, which we'll be talking more about today. Do musicians synchronize their heartbeats? And uh, let's just keep that question hanging in the air for a little bit. Now, um, the, uh, the, the event that we're talking about mainly today is called Music Lab Copenhagen. So let me just briefly introduce the concept of Music Lab. So this was, uh, they started with the uh, focus on open science, which is kind of a, uh, something that everyone is, is talking about these days and have been for a while. When we started up RITMO back in 2017, this was also a, a hot topic and we also kind of questioned what is really open science and how can we think about open science from a music research perspective? And that's not entirely easy, how to, to really handle that. So if you think about the research process, I mean, you can 
you think about it like this, you apply for your, for funding perhaps, you, you do your research, you then you have some results and you evaluate again the results. Now the problem uh, today is that a lot of this is kind of within black boxes. Uh, and even though now we're in a transition where more and more uh, material is being opened in terms of open uh, access, uh, we still, even at the result level, we're still in a grayish zone. Uh, and the other parts here are very blackish when it comes to kind of thinking about them as, as not open to the world. And what, what do I then talk about? Well, here are some of the building blocks that you can think of in kind of uh, research landscape and how they in different ways can or could be opened. So the starting point here was really to figure out, okay, can we open all these different things in different ways? And if so, how can we open these? Um, and in particular, uh, looking at some of these boxes, I mean, open access is publications, but also some of these other ones, including data, but also the methods and the notebooks, etc. So that was kind of the starting point for all of this. And uh, at Whitmo and in the Forms Lab, uh, which we have a picture of here, we have been studying people moving to music in different ways over the years. We have also uh, studying people making music and with a very high level of details. Uh, and in different different types of, of this. Uh, other types of moving to music, both playing and imitating sounds, and also then how you kind of respond to this in different ways. So one of the approaches that we like to take is that between art and science, because many of, of us working here, we kind of, we work scientifically, but we also work artistically, and we try to figure out kind of how to move between these two axes. And we also like to move between the nature and the culture sides and think of this as kind of there are different elements that kind of play together. So this kind of summarizes a lot of where we are working um, at Ritmo in general and also particularly in Music Lab. So the concept of Music Lab really started with uh, Solvay, Sörbe sitting there uh, from the University Library uh, coming to, to meet with us and um, then saying, can we set up a project together where we explore open research strategies within kind of music research. And uh, the, the concept then was developed into Music Lab. And here you have Solveig and me uh, opening the first uh, Music Lab back in 2018, I think. Uh, I think it was in 18. Um, um, and then we um, really kicked off what has become a series of events um, where the idea has been to explore a concert. So that we always have a concert at the heart of a Music Lab. But there is something else, there's some more. Uh, typically we have some kind of workshop and trying to learn something and understand something and also educate others um, along the way. We have uh, often also a panel discussion that kind of summarizes and talks about what's happened. We have data collection happening in the wild, <laughs> as we'll talk more about later. Uh, trying to understand more about how we can also uh, conduct music research in a, in a real world setting. And we have this concept of data jockeying at the end, where we also try to show some of how researchers analyze this material and get some results kind of on the fly. So it's kind of it's a combination of data collection, education, and dissemination activities in one package. Here are some pictures from some of the previous, previous ones, um, various kinds, kind of showing some of the different activities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we've had eight of these ones over the years now. In addition to this, we have seen that Music Lab as a concept has also served many other purposes than only these events. And um, it has been about the concept development, kind of just you know, understanding how we can conduct this type of research in the first place. It has been a lot of problem solving along the way on how to actually do these things, because not many people have been doing this type of music research in the world. Then, of course, publications, that's something that takes some time, and we, we, we're getting to that now, and this event today is kind of the, perhaps the first proper celebration of many of these publications. And it's also about infrastructure development. How can we also support this type of activities? And just to give you a sense of some of the problem solving we have been working with, is, for example, solving GDPR privacy issues, lots and lots of copyright issues, storage and archiving. So there's many, many things that music researchers need to kind of deal with to be able to share uh, openly or in a fair way the different things that we are collecting and working on. Now, fast forward, we're skipping a lot of the previous music labs and we'll get to kind of uh, the music like Copenhagen. But that story, I guess, starts with the Borealis concert that uh, happened at Ritmo in December 2019, um, which was in the Forms Lab, but with a real string quartet playing. They had their exam concert there. Um, 
and uh, we conducted research on them and also on some of the audience members. But this was, again, at a relatively small scale within the lab. And then uh, Simon uh, Höfting uh, was thinking about making this bigger and taking it out in the real world. And with his, his connections to the Danish String Quartet, we agreed that we should do this as a major public concert. Then Corona happened, <laughs> and we had to start postponing this event many, many times. Along the way, though, we had to test the equipment and the setup. So in the middle of Corona, we did our music test lab, which was a research slow TV event, um, taking seven hours or so. I can't remember exactly how long. It's all, it was all streamed online on YouTube with me and Solai doing the kind of live commentary of this event along the way. So if you do want to see music researchers, <laughs> Slowly putting up their cameras, testing how things work, etc. You can have seven hours of uh, slow TV that is still on YouTube for you to watch. And uh, of course, the Boreal String Quartet, a lovely uh, student string quartet from the Music Academy, also playing uh, different things along the way. So this was an, a major event uh, in kind of just testing all the equipment, making it work, etc., etc. But of course, the main goal was this event, uh, which finally happened, Music Lab Copenhagen, in October 2021. And by accident, it is exactly two years ago on this date today. So that's kind of, um, that wasn't planned actually, but that was a <laughs> nice coincidence. But here we have the Danish String Quartet sitting on stage. Uh, we'll hear more about uh, what they are wearing, etc. Uh, later. And this event, we also, uh, we also capture data from the audiences, both a live audience sitting in a hall and uh, people out in the world. Um, and this was a quite unique event. It was also broadcast on radio. And in fact, we won the event of the year uh, prize from the Danish radio uh, for this event. So that's, that's us kind of receiving this prize in, in Copenhagen. Now, finally, this, even though we are kind of closing uh, one part of this today, uh, this type of research is not, uh, has not ended at all. In fact, we have scaled up since then. Um, earlier this year, we did a big project with the Stavanger Symphony Orchestra, uh, recording them for a full week. And uh, we are going to repeat that again uh, next year uh, and in the years ahead. So this type of research is continuing um, and to a large extent based on the knowledge and experience from Music Lab Copenhagen. So that's the brief introduction to what we are talking about. Uh, and now I'm super excited to introduce Ian Cross, who's a professor at the University of Cambridge and uh, who has followed our journey, you could say, for a while and has uh, been very supportive and also um, opening uh, for having a special collection in the journal Music and Science that he leads um, uh, and uh, we had ch we challenged Ian to talk a little bit about, well, uh, not what we are doing, but the concept of doing music uh, research in the wild. So I guess that's also the, the topic of uh, his talk. So with that, Ian, please come up and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, is this thing working? Probably. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. And thanks to Simon Alexander for everyone. This is a fantastic event. Um, and I'm so pleased to be, to have been invited to be a part of it. Now, in this talk, I'm going to discuss the development of music psychology and the ways in, in which the papers from the Music Lab Copenhagen experiments that are appearing as a special collection in music and science exemplify some of the key research trajectories in the field. In particular, they embody the escape from the laboratory into the field, tracking music in the wild. I'll try to contextualize these considerations within some ideas about how we understand and do science. Ideas I sketched in a, a recent paper published in Musica Scientia entitled Sharing Uncertainty. But I'm going to start by going back in time and to a very different place from present-day Oslo. In 1898, an expedition left Cambridge for the islands of the Torres Strait between Australia and Papua New Guinea. The expedition aimed to undertake research in the new disciplines of musicology and, unusually, psychology, aiming to study the culture, lifeways and the minds of the primitive peoples to be found in these faraway archipelagos. The expedition was led by Alfred Haddon, 
and included in its members Charles Myers, who would later go on to found the Experimental Psychology Laboratory in Cambridge, and who was unusual in aiming to study mind in the wild outside the laboratory. A belief in the scientific primacy of the laboratory was central to the development of psychological method in the late 19th century. The founders of the discipline, such as Fechner, Wundt and Stumpf, were wedded to the laboratory as integral to the scientific study of mind. But Haddon and his collection of inquiring minds in the Cambridge expedition um, stood between disciplines. And to them, the idea of studying music in the wild, and mind in the wild, rather, appeared not only desirable but possible, particularly as the expedition took with them cutting-edge phonographic and cinematographic equipment, as well as innovative measuring devices, such as an electrically driven chymograph, an electrically driven drum with a smoked glass surface. Myers, seen here making one of his phonograph recordings, used the chymograph. Um, this is not necessarily the same one, it's of the type. Smoke glass drum driven by an electric motor. The recording stylus traces a spiral line over the surface as the drum rotates and moves vertically. He used the chymograph to explore a phenomenon that intrigued him. The lack of fit of the timing pattern produced by the lowest gong, the tawak, with the rhythms of the other gongs in a gamelan-type ensemble on Borneo. He asked the tawak player to tap on a morse key just as if he were beating the tawak, while the other instruments were being played as usual, recording these taps on the travelling surface of the chymograph, alongside which a clock marked intervals of 200 milliseconds on the surface. Analysis of these recordings revealed a complex rhythmic and quasi-regular pattern um, that appeared, as he put it, whoop, um, completely independent of the rest of the orchestra. Myers concluded that it is clear that the Malays of Sarawak are able to regard many successively different intervals of time as a coordinated whole, which they recognize when repeated in the course of the performance. The facu this faculty they carry to a degree which lies so far beyond the powers of civilized musicians that the latter may reasonably be skeptical of the possibility of its occurrence amongst less advanced peoples. Anyway, Myers initiative in exploring music in the wild and his speculations about the mental processes and capacities of his participants were unusual at the time and for many years subsequently. In general, psychology stayed neatly in the laboratory for the first half of the 20th century, while the dominance of the behaviorist paradigm confined the psychology of music to the study of objectively measurable phenomena, neither requiring nor in fact permitting inferences about musical minds. For instance, Carl Seashore's work. Only with the post-war development of computing machines capable of carrying out operations um, that had seemed to be the preserve of human mental life, such as remembering, calculating, logical inference, and the generation of novelty, was the concept of mind allowed back into the scientific psychology of post-war life post-Second World War life, as part of the cognitive revolution, understood by and large in computational terms. Early cognitive work on music tended to follow patterns set in the behaviourist era, treating music as abstract auditory pattern, a stimulus, to which listener could simply respond. Uh, so you ended up with highly refined methodology, largely grounded in psychophysical traditions, very complex methodology, coupled with a very, very simplistic notion of music as simply a non-linguistic auditory stimulus. There's a lot of work in that domain, carried out by and large by people who had no real connection with music. So it's unsurprising that outside a few citadels of modernism, such as the German periodical Die Reihe, these studies had little or no impact in the world of musicology, being disregarded for their presumed positivistic imperialism, whether real or not. 
within the influential US and, and UK academic systems, the Anglophone world, musicology entrenched itself firmly as a humanistic discipline, repelling what were regarded as irrelevant and uninformed incursions by scientists. This is a situation that actually still prevails in many quarters in the present day, despite the mounting evidence that science actually does have something to say about music. It was really only when music was made the proper focus of cognitive exploration in its own right, rather than as a form of non-linguistic sonic stimulus, do we find something like a contemporary scientific approach to understanding the experience of music, emerging in the work of people like Christopher Longett Higgins, Diana Deutsch, Jay Dowling, John Sloboda, Carol Krumhansel, and others. Such research, really starting in the 1960s onwards, was driven by ideas from music theory and from the music researcher's own engagement with music, leading to experimental and theoretical developments that still have meaning in the present. For example, Savoda tackled a subject that has led to high levels of frustration for many performers, sight reading. Now, he built on research in the domain of text reading and in motor control, and investigated the factors that appear to underpin successful sight reading, elucidating the idea of the eye-hand span, how much you could take in and reproduce, an idea still central in our understanding of the ability. So, for instance, one simple experiment involved getting people to sight read and simply taking the music away. How far did they continue? In most cases, about up to the end of a phrase or about 10 notes beyond when the music had been removed suggesting that a successful sight reader is reading ahead a finite amount, a chunk of music. Similarly, Jay Dowling advanced our understanding of how we can mentally represent uh, and process melodic sequences, while Carol Crumhansel, in a long series of collaborative studies, um, elucidated uh, ways in which we represent pitch relationships. That phenomenon was the focus of my own first published work, in which I collaborated with colleagues to investigate the schematic structures that derive from, this is, by the way, almost exactly 40 years ago. <laughs> <sighs> collaborated with colleagues to investigate, to, to investigate the schematic structures that derive from and come to shape our experience of musical pitch. Operation, operationalizing sensitivity to, such, to aspects of these schema as preferences for melodic sequences of different Markovian orders of approximation to diatonic structure. Now, we ended up, after a somewhat tortuous journey, with interesting results that showed that as melodic sequences in, became increasingly assimilable to diatonic structure, we increasingly prefer them suggesting that underlying our experience of pitch structure in Western tonal systems, in Western tonal music, are systems that we should be able to articulate in something like group theoretic terms. At that time, 40 years ago, it was very evident that undertaking experiments on music, one would be conducting the experiments on highly abstracted versions of music. We were still developing an understanding of the structure and dynamics of music and mind. But we're still working with quite primitive concepts. We were also focusing on behavioral studies, as technologies such as brain imaging were still in, in their infancy, and our access to computing resources was limited. Having said that, in the first study, I was using oh, absolutely cutting edge technology. I was using the Fairlight computer music instrument, <laughs> which, um, yep, which was made largely of cardboard. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, if we, <clears throat> if we, yes, it was on a trolley, and if you move the trolley from one room to another, the um, cards inside would pop slightly out of their slots. So you could only get it to work by hitting it quite hard in one particular place. <laughs> but anyway. I was using a Fairlight CMI, which allowed up to eight simultaneous channels of eight-bit sound to be computed, experienced, um, uh, sequenced, and performed, each sound having a duration of as long as half a second. We analyzed the results using the full computing resources of the University College London Psychology Department, 
a PDP-1170 mini computer with a 20 megabyte hard drive for the entire institution. So we weren't allowed to store our data, we had to print everything out. In fact, that we, as far as I remember, we didn't, act, we didn't have access to this screen. We had to use the teleprinter. But it was plain that we were not using music in the experiment, but rather an extremely reduced and abstracted, perhaps we hoped, distilled version of the experience that we hoped reflected some of the features of real-life musical phenomena we were trying to explore, and that we were deriving data from manipulations of that operational reduction. Nowadays, we have 60 years of experimental research to build on and increased theoretical sophistication. Coupled with hugely enhanced technologies and computing power, that would have seemed inconceivable even, even 40 years ago. These developments allow us to run experiments on music in the wild. To go back to Borneo, to go back to the Torres Strait, music is experienced in the real world rather than in the lab. The set of experiments that we're discussing here all derive from natural or naturalistic musical events, studying musical performance in concert and concert-like situations. They explored physiological responses and behaviours in terms of motion and gaze um, of two string qu quartets, one professional, the Danish string quartet, one student, the Borealis string quartet. They also investigated the collective behaviours and experience of audiences who participated in live and live stream versions of performances by both quartets. In addition, the research reported on the logistic and legal and ethical challenges of undertaking the research concert, evaluating the potential effects of presenting audiences with visualizations intended to elucidate the structure of the music being performed, developed theoretical interpretations of audience responses based on dynamic anticipation, and reflected on the value and complexities of undertaking uh, research on music in the wild. So somewhat to preempt what Simon will talk about later on, the research has found that performing music resulted in, for instance, significantly increased cardiac synchrony in both quartets, something that's been found in respect of choirs, not, un, not surprising, choirs do tend to have to breathe together. String quartets? Well, possibly. The Danish string quartet had higher levels of cardiac synchrony than the Borealis string quartet, and unlike them, maintained consistent cardiac synchrony in the face of significant disruption. And the research also found that the, the Danish string quartet maintained the quality of the sound uh, of musical sound and inter interactive body motion, even when their audiovisual interactions were disrupted. Though interestingly, they also showed reduced rather than increased mental effort based on pupil size when that happened. So in general, musicians, it seems, don't really require visual information to interact musically, which actually to any performing musician is not that much of a surprise. I just remember seeing the Takash String Quartet many years ago in the Wigmore Hall in London, performing a Beethoven and Bartok uh, concert. Beethoven was all right. The Bartok was just amazing. But they performed the Bartok in the second half, beginning of Bartok's drink at number four. The leader just looked around, OK, OK, guys. And on the downbeat, they all closed their eyes. And that was it. <laughs> Who needs it? But in general, musicians don't seem to require visual information to interact musically. But it's used when it's available. And when used, seems associated with increased mental effort, perhaps reflecting social engagement, or perhaps, I think, reflecting increased opportunity for risky or spontaneous and interactive joint musical behaviours, because you've got more cues to coordinate. Research has also found that audience participants in the concert hall moved least in terms of body sway when music was being performed. Not surprising. Classical audiences are not known for their bopping behaviour. But they tended to move together with their immediate neighbours. They actually did move, moving differently to different musics. And body sway has been shown to be a very good index of cooperation in conversational interaction uh, and in other contexts, and of joint emotional expression in musical ensemble performance, for instance. So it's a good indication of mutual affective and affiliative alignment. A suggestion supported by evidence in the present set of experiments that correlated movement and questionnaire data from the audience. The audience was also shown to be absorbed in the music, more so when experiencing it live, surprised, than on a live streamed performance. Interestingly, 
the live audience members exhibited collective changes in degree of movement that, appeared, that corresponded to moments in the music, collective changes that appear to be recognized and most likely responded to interactively by the performers. And again, anyone who's performed a lot will know that it's a kind of audience feel. You know when the audience is on, is with you, and you know when they're just there and you're just there. So the Copenhagen research contexts, concerts rather, take the sorry, take the research process out of the laboratory and into the real world, offering us new scientific insights into the experience of music as performer and as an audience. Music is revealed as a medium that brings those engaged with it and in it into bodily and affective alignment, perhaps to the extent that performers may experience their own agency as shared or distributed amongst those with whom they're performing. And even audiences may experience themselves as contributors to the worlds that the performers are creating. Something like a state of we intentionality may emerge between the performers and even extend to embrace the audience. Certainly, when we make music together, even when we simply listen to music, we undergo changes in our sense of our bodies, our interoceptive sense, and are in emotional states that make it more likely we'll, experience, we'll feel a sense of attachment to others. Perhaps because mutual musical engagement leads us to experience others as ourselves, as similar to ourselves. We can think of music, as I've suggested elsewhere, as an optimal means of bringing about states of affiliative alignment in interaction a mechanism for reducing social uncertainty by enhancing the human capacity for hypersociality. By the way, if anyone wants a copy of these slides, I'm happy to give it to them. So is that it? Has science finally understood the epistemic core of music? Fortunately not, otherwise we'd really be out of a job. Partly because there's so much more to be discovered. For example, concerts, wonderful as they are, do not encompass the totality of musical experience, as I'm going to discuss later. And partly because even the research concert, Tackling Music in the Wild, is subject to some of the same limitations that constrained earlier laboratory-based attempts to illuminate music. Limitations that appear intrinsic to the practice of science. As I've noticed elsewhere, noted elsewhere, in uh, designing an experiment, the complex phenomenon to be investigated is operationally reduced, and it's the operational reduction rather than the full-blown, messy, contextually embedded real-world phenomenon upon which the experiment will be conducted. It's certainly the case that taking the real-world concert situation as the locus of research brings us closer, much closer, to a scientific understanding of music as experienced than would be the case uh, if we'd, for instance, simply played the performance in recorded form to an audience, treating the performance simply as a stimulus to which the audience could respond, but with which they could not interact, other than imaginatively. I mean, other recent studies have shown that uh, there's a qualitative difference in the experience of live and recorded music, and we actually here see in this set of experiments a difference in audience behaviours between live and live stream versions of the event. But even in the live situation, what's being investigated is not the concert, but a severely reduced version of it. There are straightforwardly pragmatic reasons for this. We can only make use of a limited uh, set of technologies from which we can only collect so much data without actually influencing the quality of what we're attempting to investigate. For instance, it would have been considerable interest to explore the neural data from quartet and audience using, for instance, EEG or FNIRS. But that data would have been likely to have been extraordinarily messy. If anyone's done EEG on musical performance, it's horrible. It's really horrible. Most of the signal is just people moving, eye blinks, head, just stuff. Um, all sorts of movement artifacts. Also, the technology would have been likely to have been perceived as intrusive by both performers and audience. It would have taken a long time to rig up the performers and the audience, and an even longer time to make sure you were getting data. So performer and audience would probably have experienced the event as qualitatively very different from the technologically unencumbered normal concert situation. Interestingly, this is not a novel issue. 
The extent to which the use of then cutting edge technology by the Torres Strait expedition in 1898 may have shaped the perceptions and behaviours of their indigenous informants has been the focus of quite a lot of debate in recent anthropological literature. Reductionism turns out to be a really good uh, strategy for designing and implementing a scientific experiment intended to, to test a hypothesis about a particular state of affairs, in this case, for instance, a concert, and to generate predictions about other states of affairs of a similar kind, other concert situations. It enables rigorous control over aspects of the state of affairs that one wants to test. It, you, you're able to tightly characterize parameters and differentiate between those expected to be operational and those that are not. It supports quantifications of the parameters, of the changes likely to arise because of manipulations in the course of the experiment, and of the pattern of results that can be selected as criteria in determining whether or not the experiment's conformed to or has disproven the original hypothesis. In Schultz's terms, operational reductionism is the belief that the properties or behaviour of a composite system, here a concert for instance, can be predicted from an understanding of the properties or behaviour of its constituents' parts studied in isolation. It constitutes a widespread and highly effective strategy in the practices of, of science. It's what you do. You've simply got to control your variables. But it's not the whole of science. It's driven by the need to control real-world situations in order that appropriate observations can be made and rests partly on the nature of the instrumentation employed and partly on the conceptualization of the situation that's being investigated. In effect, any experiments being carried out on a model of the real world situation and observations are being made by means of specific instruments that embody different types and levels of complexity of technology. From the technology of writing through to the superconducting quantum interference devices, squids, that are employed in MEG, magneto encephalographic machines, to the Large Hadron Super Collider. The exigencies of different real-world situations impose constraints on the technology that can be deployed. In the present experiment, or at least in one of them, unobtrusive wireless uh, electrocardiogram sensors relayed cardiac signals via Bluetooth for remote recording with minimal interference uh, with the musician's capacity to perform as they would wish. These signals are taken as representative of performers' heartbeats and are subject to complex analytic procedures in the temporal domain to abstract data that can be interpreted and to interpret the degree to which things are aligned in time. That interpretation takes place in the context of conditions imposed on the performers within the experiment that are expected to give rise to meaningful differences in the data, degrees of cardiac synchrony. Here, the concert situation is effectively reduced to a set of relationships between degrees of cardiac synchrony between performers and a number of different experimental conditions that can be analysed and interpreted as informative about the performer's experience of the performance as shared. Many aspects of the real-world phenomenon that are likely to relate to the experience of the event as joint or collective necessarily remain unaddressed. For instance, common temporal or spatially located neural activity. However, the finding of cardiac synchrony in the real-world concert means that we can develop informed and potentially predictive hypotheses about other likely correlates of the shared experience of performance that may be capable of being tested with the right technology and experimental design. In the end, the extent to which operational reduction, the, sorry, the extent to which the operational reduction that guides the conduct of the experiment constitutes a more or less comprehensive representation of the state of affairs being explored will determine the extent to which the experimental results can be interpreted so as to give rise to predictions about similar real-life world situations and to generalise beyond these, to give rise to what are effectively scientific theories or to refine scientific theories. Methodological reduction should, we hope, lead to increasingly accurate scientific theory, which is not the same thing as saying that we shall necessarily be able to explain the real world phenomenon in terms of scientific theory. <clears throat> Just because we expect methodological reduction to work 
doesn't mean we can reduce all knowledge to science. In the first place, science is not even science. It is, more or less, the sciences. Scientific knowledge is not really expressible in terms of one grand epistemic framework, but takes a range of disparate, though commensurable, forms. And the success of methodological reductionism is no guarantee that we can even reduce one form of scientific explanation to another. We can't simply reduce biochemistry to chemistry, for instance, or psychoacoustics to acoustics. As Huttmann and Love, Love put it, explanatory and methodological reduction can be decoupled because they do not entail one another. Methodological reductionism does not guarantee explanatory success, and a successful explanatory reduction does not imply that methodological reduction is the most favorable strategy of inquiry. In Gutting's words, scientific realism should be construed as a commitment to the ability of scientific methodology to provide an ultimately complete account of what there is. It should not be construed as a commitment to the essential completeness of current scientific accounts. We are, of course, and I'm not going to quite go with this, he claims, we are, of course, still claiming that the description of the world ultimately given by science will be complete and accurate. But we must be careful to separate this methodological claim from a metaphysical enthronement of the ontology of current science. That would be even stronger, actually. And I'd say that in the end, scientific understanding must be understood as provisional in nature. For the last 60 years or so, it's been evident that science proceeds not by verifying scientific hypotheses by means of experiment, but by trying to falsify them. Moreover, the factors that shape scientific understanding have to be considered as extending beyond the apparently fixed boundaries um, that demarcate hypothesis formation and scientific method, so as to incorporate, encompass aspects of human judgment, belief, and social practice. In some accounts of science, usually referenced to Thomas Kuhn and the notion of paradigm shift, science is created by what scientists believe and debate every bit as much as it is by the use of particular methods and the existence of specifiable scientific facts. In such accounts, science appears to be a cultural pursuit with no more privileged claim to understanding than any other domain of human judgment. I think there are good arguments for rejecting this pure social constructionist view. I'm not going to rehearse them here other than to say they're wrong. <laughs> But even discounting the deconstructive implications of extreme social constructionist views of science, it's clear that scientific knowledge is not a terminus, but part of a process of understanding the world that's always provisional, always susceptible to, subject to revision. As I've noted earlier, we've, we've learned a great deal from the research concert. The concert situation does not encompass the totality of musical experience. It assigns quite specific roles to its participants, sharply differentiating performers from audience. While this may seem natural, other forms of engagement in which the participants' roles in music making are much less clearly delineated may be more prevalent worldwide. Some recent work that suggests this. Using a distinction made by the ethnomusicologist Thomas Perino, Torino, we can distinguish between presentational and participatory forms. In the presentational world of the Western concert, audience and performer are clearly distinct and remain so. In participatory musical, um, participatory forms of musical engagement, participants are expected, encouraged, to move between the roles of audience member and performer. Now, in fact, as the results of the current work show, audience and performer, um, audience members are not passive. They contribute. They may move, and their presence and levels of engagement with the performance may well be reflected in the behaviours of the performers. So there's an interesting virtuous cycle. In other words, even in presentational contexts, audiences participate. These should not be taken as categorical distinctions, but as poles of a continuum. In a, a concert, the roles may be more circumscribed than they were if they were aka pygmy hunter-gatherers engaged in the collective and complexly polyphonic performance of Makonde Masani, 
But it can be argued that the Western concert audience successful and collective fulfillment of their role is as indispensable to the success of the concert event as are the efforts of the performers. Having said that, one significant difference between much presentational and most participatory music is scriptedness. In the Western classical tradition, performers enact a detailed and complex musical script, a musical score, whereas in a typical participatory context, performance appears unscripted and spontaneous, often exhibiting much lower levels of complexity than does presentational performance. An increasing amount of research is addressing the complexity and dynamics of the Western concert audience, of the Western musical concert, but substantive efforts to explore the dynamics of participatory music making are still, on the whole, lacking. This is quite understandable. It's much more difficult. The Western concert situation is endowed with a central unifying element, the musical score, that coordinates, we think, perhaps, the thoughts and actions of both performer and audience, while serving to render those thoughts and actions interpretable in experimental contexts. Uh, so even though in participatory contexts, participatory performance might be guided by script-like elements that exist in the mind of participants by virtue of long-term engagement in specific cultural practice, they are much less easy than script-guided presentational events to assimilate into forms amenable to rigorous experimental investigation. All this may seem to devalue the extraordinary findings of the Copenhagen research series of Music Lab Copenhagen. But because of this set of experiments, we now know hugely more than we did from scientific perspectives about musical performance and its collective experience. And we can be more certain about what we do not know. We cannot claim that scientific knowledge that has emerged is absolutely true any more than we might claim that humanistic interpretive approaches to understanding the concert situation would afford privileged and univocal understandings. But science offers the possibility of developing knowledge within ramified and connectable frames of understanding in ways that humanistic approaches don't. And in this case, we have not one, but at least six experiments a contextualization of important cultural and ethical issues and an overview of the event, its logistics and disciplinary embeddings. The methods and materials of all experiments um, are highly contextualized and integrated, speaking to each other and giving a kind of 360 degree view. What is known is shared across scientific and uh, humanistic uh, boundaries, which should allow a much richer identification of what it remains to be known and how it might be known. At the very least, the outcome of the, the Cop music lab of Copenhagen is a clearer understanding of the uncertainties that are shared across disciplinary boundaries, which, as I've suggested elsewhere, have to be key to unlocking the doors between the humanities and the sciences. The admission of what we don't know and of how we don't actually know it is probably more important and certainly much rarer than is the proclamation of what we think we know. We're much less willing to say, you know what, we don't know, than we are to say, mm, we've just found this out. OK. Amongst the things we don't know are the long-term implications of the results of doing experiments in music in the wild. It may be that the findings fade into history. It may be that they open up new pathways for research that shaped the next 50 years of research. It may be they have long range consequences in the real world we cannot yet foresee. Going back to my starting point, the Torres Strait expedition certainly had resonances that Charles Myers, Alfred Haddon, and his Cambridge colleagues and his indigenous informants would not have imagined in 1898. As well as the electrically driven chymograph, they took phonographic and cinematic equipment, returning to Cambridge with the first ever ethnographic film, as well as some of the earliest field recordings of non-Western musics. And if you want to hear them, they're actually online. It's part of the British, it's the earliest, field, earliest recordings in the British Library collection. They're, you can almost make out what's going on. <laughs> I mean, it's, as, as Myers said when he was recording on his chymograph, the 
drummer tapping on the tabak. He said he, he, was, he wanted to try and listen to the relationship between the rest of the ensemble and what the drummer was doing. But my attention was focused on making sure my equipment was working. <laughs> Which, fair enough. But some 90 years after they were made, these recordings proved to be central to one of the first and perhaps the most significant of the land rights claims made by the indigenous Australians and, Australians and Torres Strait Islanders. As you can see, there was a particular case brought, a claim by some Torres Strait Islanders, Eddie Mabel and others, against the government of Queensland, claiming that they owned the land. When the British arrived was Captain Cook when he arrived, he simply proclaimed that this was terra nullius. It belonged to no one. So we're going to have it, which is something Britain did quite a lot in those days. Um, the indigenous Torres Strait Islanders claimed, no, actually, we have some claim on this land. We have native title. Now, the success of the claim to native title in this case depended at least in part on the fact that the recordings of the songs made in the 1950s and 60s were more or less the same as recordings made by the Torres Strait expedition. So there was continuity, at least over the last 60, 70 years. And in this legal context, what happens is that the recordings, most likely made by Charles Myers or Charles Seligman, came to acquire deontic force placing contemporary Australian society under the obligation to recognise indigenous ownership of land that had effectively been stolen from them in the British invasion of 1788 and earlier in 1766. Grace Koch talks about that very specific point, and it is something that is increasingly recognised, that land rights and song in Australia are bound together. Tightly. Now, might the present findings prove equally influential in the long term? If they do, I suspect and hope that it might be because they underscore the centrality of affiliative interaction for the experience of being human. Musical interaction seems to constitute a play space for us to exercise and enhance our social capacities. And the results of the Music Lab Copenhagen studies provide supportive, substantive support for this. Evidence is accumulating that humans are intrinsically social. We're actually quite bright, but we're even more social than we're bright. Our thoughts and behaviours seem to be shaped by and in our interactions with others as much as they are by any act of individual will. As Rita Hari puts it, social interaction could be the default mode via which humans communicate with their environment. The study of music in the wild, I hope, is strengthening the evidence for the shared intentionality that emerges from affiliative social interaction as fundamental to being human. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ian. Is this working? Uh, just checking, checking. Yep, it's good. Um, thanks for a wonderful uh, lecture with many different perspectives and also touching upon several of the things that we have been thinking about uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to Music Lab Copenhagen. Now we have time for questions and comments. Anyone? Thank you, Ian, for a really, really um, thought-provoking uh, um, talk. I've, I really learned a lot. Um, I was wondering, so, so you know, concert research is a way of uh, studying music in the wild. Um, and of course, th that, that will al always be very con contextual and, you know, every, every single musical event is different and mm -hmm. so on. But like, how, how can we, 
what is the best way to, because you know, as, as scientists, at least some of us are interested in, in drawing general conclusions mm. about musical behavior, you know, across time and across space and so on. How, how can we make concert research um, better suited for kind of studying general, um, you know, cognitive phenomena and, uh, um, you know, social phenomena and so on? Keep doing it. Seriously, I mean, it, it's a bit rude here. Oh, is that mic live? I think that mic up there might be live. Because as I approached it, it... Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah um, effectively, yeah, keep doing it. That is, science is pretty much cumulative. Um, and yes. Any concert is, com is, is bound to its context. Um, but yes, we can generalize to a certain extent. But for instance, in respect to the concert situation, it really helps to understand, well, what do we mean by concert situation? How long has it been there for? What is its contextual cultural embedding? Um, how, does, how is that differentiated from other ways of having music in some sort of pre presentational context? How might that have changed over time? For that, you need one needs to talk to anthropologists, musicologists, ethnomusicologists, all need to be engaged. It's not something that is discreetly a scientific problem. It becomes a scientific problem when we try and operationalize it. And that's where the interesting and tough bit is, I think. Um, and then the really, the tougher bit is then trying to work out what, what now do we know and what do we still not know? And that, I think, is really critical, um, that we have to delineate and share with people in other disciplines what we don't know at all levels, because that then helps ramify the hypothesis and make things potentially more generalizable. But yeah, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's a rubbish answer. <laughs> but just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. I really, yeah, uh, I really second uh, Nils's appreciation. It was a wonderful, wonderful, uh, insightful uh, lecture. There's something about the conception of the, how the different sciences work together and how they can work together that you touched on, mm. and that maybe you can uh, elucidate mm. a little bit further. So, uh, in the context of the uh, concert we did, one regret mm. that that uh, that I have is that we didn't do. I, any real thorough qualitative studies, mm. right? So you're talking about methodological reductionism yeah. that of course is pervasive yeah. in the so-called hard sciences. Yeah. But as a philosopher, I also believe myself to be some kind of scientist. And, and I think that, that my, my other humanistic uh, mm -hmm. colleagues here w w uh, might, might uh, also agree with that. And, and so when you are doing, for instance, uh, qualitative uh, work in forms mm -hmm. of interviews, observations, the kind of view of the world that you get from a concert, well, maybe you, I don't know if you will call it reductionistic, but it's not reductionistic in the same way yeah. that, that the reductionisms that you're talking about through the, the various equipments with which we are measuring. Yes. So, so these can be integrated in a, in a better way, I, I, I believe. And I wonder how you, how, if you have any insights on, on, on that very tricky and difficult um, uh, achievement. Okay, well, first in the first place, it's not just the technology that it's not just the technology that imposes the constraints that embody methodological reductionism. It's partly what we think of as scientific process. Uh, but again, like the presentational versus participatory, we're not talking about discrete categories. We're talking about sciences, humanities, mm, there's stuff in the middle the messy stuff in the middle, which is what we try and inhabit much of the time. Um, just as an example, um, a few years ago, doing a series of experiments looking at the perception, uh, um, perceptual characterization of violin acoustics. How do you tell one violin from another by the sound alone? Did a large scale series of studies, because actually with violins you can reduce it to, um, in physical terms, to two independent systems, string and body. And so we were able to re mix recording of the string at the bridge and then feed that through computer-generated models of violin bodies. So we fit the same performance to different violins. And that gave us, in, uh, we did a series of psychoacoustical type experiments and we were able to 
um, work out what the uh, constraints were on one's ability to distinguish between this violin and that violin. Basically, you have to change any of the low wood resonance modes by at least half a semitone. Sorry, by at least a semitone, which is, seems quite a lot, but it's just perceptible. Um, we then decided that we would see how this has been characterized qualitatively. So we looked, we did, um, one of my computational colleagues did a trawl through the archives of the Strad magazine, which has been running for about 150 years, looking for all the words that have been used to characterize violin sound quality. We then produced some, I think, 300 words, and we did a straightforward um, multidimensional scaling experiment, getting people to rate the similarity of pit word pairs, all possible word pairs, and we ended up with, as it beautifully, a three-dimensional solution with, um, for instance, dull or um, dull and bright and um, noisy and smooth. And I can't remember what the third dimension was. It doesn't really matter. Um, we got that far. And we would, I was discussing with my colleagues, a psychophysicist, a computer scientist, and an engineer, but should, should we just publish these findings? Because they were quite interesting. Or should we um, use them in a further experiment? And my engineering colleague said, well, I think the only place we're going to publish these is in the Journal of Extremely Soft Science. <laughs> As it happened, we ended up using these um, terms in a further study where we generated different violin sounds that we reckoned would incorporate to a greater or lesser extent more or less of each of the three distinct dimensions we found. Um, and the one thing we thought, we, the only thing we weren't able to work out was nasality. Because, you know, you talk about well, violence and strings and oh, nasal. Now, it, it's been suggested that this is to do with a deficit, or sorry, an excess of sound in the region between about 900 um, and 1600 hertz. And so we thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Half our participants said, if there's more sound in that region, it's nasal. And half said, if there's less sound in that region, it's nasal. OK, how do you explain that? Well, OK, could this be something to do with the linguistic background of uh, participants? So let's redo the thing in France, which is a much more nasalized language. They might be more hypersensitive to it. We did exactly the same experiment in France. We got exactly the same results. So I have no idea what nasal means. No one does. Um, that's a long-winded way of putting it, of, of su suggesting that we can do qualitative studies and we can integrate them with quantitative studies. We can put them together. And we should. We have to. Because we have to try and contextualize the numbers in the experience, as it were. The numbers that fall out of the quantitative research in the experience that is reflected, however indirectly, in the qualitative research. One of the things we do know is that people have no idea what they're doing most of the time, um, or no, particularly no idea of the bases of judgment. You know, that's better than that. Why? Well, no idea. Um, so the, it is often the case that qualitative data requires to be complexly triangulated in order to get some sort of clarity and consistency and stability. But it's just part of the process. One needs to span the whole spectrum from the extremely quantitative to the extremely qualitative. If you don't have all of them, you won't have anything. Or rather, you have a return to the days of the 1960s when people thought they'd cracked it because you could turn it into numbers and relate it to computational metaphors. And that's it. It wasn't. Great. Questions? a bonus point for the first master student that wants to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> but all these are allowed as well. Mm. Don't be shy. <coughs> thank you, thank you for the very, very amazing uh, talk. Okay. Um, one of the points that, that you touched is uh, how music research has evolved a little bit, or a lot, uh, with uh, also improvement in, in technology mm. and uh, so particularly computational methods mm. uh, have improved a lot in the last decades and will keep improving yep. uh, 
uh, so to what degree do you think that so that there must be a limit to what we could capture that 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 lies beyond what uh, we can record uh, or we can uh there probably is um which is not much of an answer. Uh -huh. uh, so, so, for example, uh, with optical motion capture mm -hmm. uh, right now, yep. so we need sophisticated systems with cameras and markers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, but now deep learning powered methods can extract uh, uh, movement from video. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot less restrictive. Yeah. Uh, it's not quite there yet, but it will be there at, at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're the same for different kinds of recordings. Uh, and so we will be able to capture a lot more of the experience of the audience and uh, the musicians. Mm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it goes down, comes down to what are the units that are being measured? Now, uh, again, I'm going to give a, an instance which may not be quite as relevant or coherent. But one of my current PhD, one of my PhD students just finished um, is looking at the match between tone, lexical tone, and pitch in um, song in a particular Chinese language, Zhaozhou. Zhaozhou is a minority Chinese language which is spoken by only four times as many people who speak Swedish. But it's a complicated language in that it has mm, up to nine different lexical tones. That is, pitch levels or pitch directions or trajectories that determine the semantic value of a syllable. <clears throat> now, in song, the quest her question was, are these pitch levels respected? And the first, first set of results, yeah, absolutely, they do tend to be respected. More so in traditional Chaozhou song than in more contemporary pop-based Chaozhou song. What she also found is, however, that within what appear to be individual notes, there is variability and variation. And that, uh, that variation has never really been explored, as has never been explored as a in the context of a research question. It's been, ex you know, for Chaozhou speakers it's, or Chaozhou singers, this is how you you make it, this is how you sing it, so it sounds right. But the sounds right seems to relate to variation within the syllable that relates to the contextualization of the surrounding semantic tones. So until you identify what it is that you actually want to explore, doesn't matter what the technology is, um, you still won't be able to get there. So the technology may improve and improve and improve, but we have to clarify what it is that we are actually measuring. And that's always going to be a moving, perhaps, I think, a bit of a moving target. Um, because, uh, for, for instance, in the case of hmm, motion capture, how does one relate what it is that is going on between individuals in terms of what else is going on, what other channels. So, for instance, and I'm, I'm doing it right now. I'm speaking to you. There's no reason why I should be moving my hands around. But if I put them in my pocket, it would be much more difficult to speak to you. In other words, speech communication is multimodal. So one would need to look not just at the movement, let's say one wanted to look at what's going on in a conversational interaction or in a musical interaction, you'd have somehow to relate the acoustical and the um, conceptualization of the acoustical to the movement. Um, and that then becomes the target, not just the movement. So, as I say, it's always going to be a bit of a moving target, I think. We, we're we're going to get better, but I think it's always going to be provisional. Probably. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Um, you've noted over the past decade, certainly since World War II, all of the 
mm. enabling technologies that allowed us to do mm. more and more in terms of studying music. And you've also emphasized music in terms of a collective social mm. uh, enterprise. But it's maybe ironic that also those same technologies allow us more and more to ex experience music as individuals rather mm. than in a social context. Yep. So could you comment upon how, as the technology is going one way, the musical experience in some way, for some of the time, is going the opposite way? Because more people experience music as individuals than in groups or in collective settings that, than in previous eras. That's almost undoubtedly the case in weird societies, weird being <clears throat> Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, theoretically. Um, most people experience music individually, often to the extent that they're damaging their hearing. Um, it is not a good thing. I think it is a problem, generally, in that the more we retreat into ourselves, the less human we become, I suspect. Humans, I think it was Terry Pratchett pointed out, need to experience the Brownian motion of society to be human. We need to be bounced around by other people. And the more that we detach and technologize our interactions with the world, hmm, the more problematic I think that is. I think we have evolved to be hypersocial. And we're currently, and this is just in the last 10, 15 years, experiencing technology that is detaching us one from another. I think it's a bit of a problem. We're also experiencing that at often governmental levels. Oh, why should we bother with uh, arts, for instance? Music education, drama, English, humanities. We don't really need that, we just need numbers. Um, we have to get these morons out. Um, it's a fundamental problem that I think is common to all industrialized societies. We've got a have a degree of human interaction embedded in the way our societies work and non-technologized. That is, relying on face-to-face -face social cues. We recently, one of our graduate students, um, Hugh Cheston, is doing a series of studies looking at jazz performers interacting via simulated Zoom. So it's a vari it's variable delay of between about 90 milliseconds or 180 milliseconds, but with spikes that could go up to 300, 400 milliseconds. We find that the jitter, the spikes, don't really make much difference, but the, the delay makes a huge difference in the ways they're able to interact. In general, um, as the delays get longer, um, the more likely they are to slow down and get out of time with each other. Unless they do something that they t would not tend to do in the real world, which is just say, okay, one of, one of us is the leader and I will slavishly follow. In general, in the real world, musical and linguistic interaction tends to be mutually adaptive. I will adapt to what you are doing, you will adapt to what I'm doing, etc., etc. In some narrow context, you will follow a central timekeeper. The use of something like Zoom imposes that sort of leadership strategy, it seems. I haven't got a huge amount of data, but enough to, to be fairly sure that this is what's going on. That leadership strategy enables them to kind of stay together in a kind of appropriate way. The ones who can do it best, by the way, are the ones who are most experienced with one pair who are jazz superstars. And they just did that because they've been doing it for 30, 40 years, and they've been playing in let's call it suboptimal locations for many years. And you just do whatever you have to do to get from the beginning to the end. And that was one way of doing it. But it's not the one that they would have tended to use in the real world. And it's not the one that would be most creative, musical, social, and interpersonal. Yeah, so yes. Also for people online now, if you have questions for Ian, mm. then please also type them into the, the chats. Um, Question. Yeah, I, I think I just wanted to follow up on something that uh, uh, Justin just mm. said, and also related to the um, the last slide that you showed. So, also thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I actually got goosebumps uh, <laughs> with that Ooh. last ending slide with okay. the. Uh, I, 
actually took a picture, picture of the slide of this, uh, the shared intentionality that emerges from affiliative social interaction as fundamental to being human yep. and how sort of this concert research can uh, contribute to that view. Uh, but I wondered if there's anything, like if you think about the solitary music listening mm. situation, where we still can somehow yes. have that yes. feeling of um, maybe affiliative social interaction just <coughs> by uh, Absolutely. listening to music. Absolutely. And it was far too condemnatory. Because yes, exactly. One, either in solitary music making, what, what um, Andrew Killick, the ethnomusicologist, calls holocipatory music making, or in solitary music listening. And there is interestingly archaeological evidence for solitary music making, um, probably in this part of the world, certainly in Denmark and in East Anglia. One of my colleagues, Graham Lawson, music archaeologist, discovered um, that a lot of willow bark end blown pipes were made. Now, in order to do that, you, you can only do it at a particular time of year, in spring, late spring, when you've got the, the shoots, the coppices, at the base of the willow. You have to select a coppice, a, few, uh, a, a, a twig that's about so long, with one single bud at the tip, cut it off at the base, cut the tip off, put a notch in, a hand span from the end, and then beat it, just beat it all over, and slip the pith out. And you're left with a hollow tube of damp bark. And you can use that as an end blown flute and create a harmonic series and play tunes. It lasts for about two hours, then it dries out and falls to pieces. The evidence that, le that is left is the core, which is about so long with no buds and a, a notch, a hand span from one end. And it's likely that people doing boring but necessary jobs like shepherding, looking after the sheep, were doing this just to, to be social, to be virtually social, to be with other people in their heads, when they were by themselves. So yes, music does enable that. And we, we, we talk to ourselves. We actually talk to ourselves a lot. And it's the same sort of thing, I think. It is probably an expression of sociality. It's a virtual engagement with the social world. And yes, the trouble with the technologization of it is I think it kind of is one way. It's a bit one way. If you're listening to a recording, you're listening to something that has no real interactive capacity. You're engaging with something which has no real interactive capacity. So if that's all you engage with, I mean, it's one of the things that has happened since COVID is the, and, and Spotify, and Spotify, is the rise of the concert, the live concert. It's become far more, more and more important. A lot of people are going to concerts. There you have collective experiences of a sort that then you can you know, use in your MP3 or whatever, your streamed, um, live streamed, solitary listening. But you've got this connectability, connections. It's when you start to lose those connections, I would worry. It's when Elon Musk buys Spotify, then we worry. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. I guess I have a related question to this mm. idea of uh, the paradigm of recorded music mm. and to use the idea of recorded music uh, in place of music, whatever that would be, uh, which it, to me is quite analogous to, the, to using the idea of the image as mm. yeah. seeing the world. And I was wondering if you had any comments about um, visual perception research and the analogy of uh, everything that we've been talking about really because uh, mm. there is quite strong evidence to suggest that visual perception is also guided in very specific ways in order to perform social functions in yes. many yeah. contexts. And yeah, I would just uh, wonder about your thoughts about that. Well, I think I'd really just endorse that point. There is a convergence. Um, as I said, in respect of um, conversational interaction, it's multimodal, um, so that t to focus on one dimension is to exclude and to lose a lot of information, particularly in a scientific context. And there's a huge amount of um, speech research that just ignores gesture. And as soon as you put the gesture in, suddenly a lot makes sense. That wouldn't really make sense from the, 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 the um, acoustical stream itself. 
And in fact, you can make sense if you just show the gesture, which turns out to be really interestingly culture-specific and culture-general. Um, there's some very interesting... Everyone should read Adam Kendon's book, Gesture, Cambridge University Press, 2004. Really very interesting. Um, it turns out if you just show someone the gesture stream, as it were, they get a lot of information about social attitudes, affect, etc., that you don't actually need the speech for. Much of the speech is pretty irrelevant, um, which goes for a lot of speech these days. Um, so, yeah, I think I just see, yeah, there is that convergence. Yeah. I have a question about uh, more on the educational side, mm. because um, you've been um, in doing research in this field for 40-plus for years or so, <laughs> according mm. to your slides. But I, you have also been a professor and teacher uh, for mm. many, many years. And um, I'm just wondering about, uh, I mean, when you're talking about something like Music Lab Copenhagen and mm. where people are coming together and working together from mm. different perspectives, uh, but also the, the importance of, of combining uh, theoretical perspectives and also mm. methodological competencies, mm. etc. How then, um, as a department of musicology, when you're training bachelor and master students, what should we actually teach the students uh, when it comes to these type of things? And uh, from your perspective, looking at kind of how the field has been developing, mm. the importance of both quantitative and qualitative, but also yeah. the, the knowledge about everything you need to read and know and learn, etc., to be able to do anything meaningful. What should new bachelor students learn when it comes to music research? <laughs> oh my God. <coughs> Simple question. Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, doing music. Um, actually doing it. Not just thinking about it to start with, and not just you know, reading what other people have thought about it, but doing it. Um, that's key, because that then provides a nucleus around which other things can grow, other understandings can grow. I was very fortunate as a, an undergraduate student, because I'd I actually started doing law at Glasgow University when I was 16, just too young. I dropped out to try and become a pop star, which didn't really work. Um, turned into a classical guitarist, because I'd been playing classical guitar for many years. Ended up performing for about 10 years. Um, in the middle of which, I was asked, I did a couple of performance diplomas and things, I was asked, would I teach guitar at the Royal Scottish Academy? And realised, I didn't actually know very much about music. Hmm. So I thought I should go and do a music degree. And looked around and was fortunate enough to find a BSc in music at City University, which was just in its third year of existence, and which was completely insane. In the first year, we studied physics, maths, medieval music, ethnomusicology, um, basic computing, recording techniques, performance, improvisation, everything. And for me, that was just fantastic because I, I was coming to it as a mature student, as it were. I just, I just loved it. It was fabulous. It may not be for everyone, but that I think is one one possible approach. Just everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. And then on the other side, then I mean, when you're doing this type of research, and uh, as a researcher, I want to publish mm. these things. Mm. And now you're sitting as editor in chief of a journal and have a lot of editorial experience, and then. One of the challenges that we have also experienced when it comes mm. to this uh, collection yeah. um, is also to convince the reviewers yeah. and peers that, that about that this is valuable and yes. should go out there. And what is your take on this again, from mm. this extremely multi or interdisciplinary type of perspective? How, how, we, how are you thinking and how should we think about kind of publishing and getting these results out when there are so many different perspectives that kind of come together and are criticized for lacking everything, basically, on every side. Well, one possible strategy is just what you've done. That is, a collection of papers with multiple different perspectives, often on the same set of issues. That really helps. Because oh, that, there's, there are many, many papers out there which are kind of, kind of monocular. You know, it's, it's this sort of vision. And we need the 360-degree the view. So you, that, that one approach is precisely what you've done. It's much more difficult. It's much more time-consuming. Um, but it's a way of ensuring that 
what is done is contextualized and fitted um, and understood as properly representative of the research questions that can be asked. Um, other than that, I'm really not sure. <laughs> but I think it does come down to that, having the ability, having the potential to make clear that what is being explored has value across multiple dom domains. Yep. Great. Perhaps that's a good place to end this session here now and then um, have a break and then we'll uh, reconvene at 2 o'clock uh, and you can take this as a teaser then for kind of the first uh, launch of the special collection and also we can continue some of this discussion yep. in the panel discussion later on. But first of all, uh, let's give a big hand to Ian Cross. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be back then at 2 o'clock. See you then. Oof. And there will be food at the end. Two <laughs> <laughs> um, o'clock. Welcome back um, to this um, Music and Science special collection launch. Um, and for those of you that are now kind of just tuning in, now we're actually getting to the launch part itself, uh, which will be followed by a, a panel discussion. And then it's my pleasure to uh, give the word to Stephen Hunting who used to be a postdoc at WIFMO and who was kind of the initiator of everything we're talking about here uh, today. Uh, and uh, Simon has since then moved on to a position in Denmark, but he's still also affiliated with WIFMO, so we're very happy about that. And you will take us on a, on a tour of uh, this special collection. So yeah. Over to you. Thank you so much, Alexander. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming. And thank you to uh, the people in the virtual uh, live stream for, uh, for joining. Uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to present the event that, uh, that we host, that we, that we ran together. Uh, so many people were involved in that. Uh, um, and also to, uh, to now to launch uh, some of the, the results that, are, that uh, many of them have come out and there's still more uh, coming out. So, as you, uh, as most of you hopefully heard from uh, Alexander's talk uh, earlier, uh, music lab as such is a concept that was uh, conceived by uh, by Solvay Sørby from uh, from the University Library uh, and uh, and Alexander uh, from uh, from Ritmo as uh, as a way to integrate music and science and science communication. Now, what we get when we move into the instantiation of Music Lab that we call Music Lab Copenhagen is all of that uh, plus this collaboration with the Danish String Quartet, uh, for whom we have the, uh, the representative of Frederik Øland in, in, uh, in the room. So, um, so the Danish String Quartet is, is one of the best quartets uh, in the planet. And uh, what they have is that every, uh, every year, uh, for, for several uh, years, they have a festival that they call the DSQ Festival, and uh, where, they, where they invite some friends to come play with them, and they also do quite a bit of artistic experimentation. And what was uh, wonderful was that they, they very kind of graciously allowed us to hijack one of the concerts in that festival program that was probably four concerts, I think, and, and we got to hijack uh, one of those to, to make the, um, the, the Music Lab uh, Copenhagen. So... I'm going to present uh, two parts in, uh, in this talk. They will last for about half an hour, and hopefully that we can take some, some, uh, some questions. Um, and some of it will be overlapping both with what Alexander has said and what uh, Ian has said. So I hope you, you, you don't get too bored with, uh, with it. Um, so I'll present firstly about the, uh, about the event itself, so something about the music and the musicians, then about the uh, science, and then about the science uh, communication. Part two uh, is then about the, the scientific uh, results also, because we call this a launch event, and you may wonder, well, what is it that we are launching exactly? Well, we are, in a sense, launching this special collection of, uh, of, of the Open Access Journal, um, uh, Music and Science, that we have then called Music Lab Copenhagen, and uh, the wonderful keynote that you just heard from Ian, and thank you so much, Ian, that was really very enlightening. So Ian is the, the editor-in-chief 
of uh, music and science that, that the journal. So then, in the second part, I will, uh, I will, uh, I will tell you about uh, some of the results that we have obtained from all the studies we have uh, done. Now, I should, of course, uh, uh, on a kind of a very humbly note, that, uh, that I alone cannot do justice to all the amazing and inspiring and thorough research that all my colleagues have done over the three, uh, last three years at least. There's just no way that that is possible. So it's a very crude overview that I'm going to give. And it's, of course, also an encouragement to all of you and all of you in the virtual stream to then go and read the actual articles that substantiate the things that I'm going to, uh, uh, to be saying. And I should, of course, also mention that to those of you uh, uh, in the audience who are not scientists, uh, for the sake of you also, I'm not going to go into to the technical details of, of the results and the methods that, you, that we have, uh, that we have, uh, we have used. Mm. So we can say that in the overview I'm going to give uh, is, is, uh, is a simplification of, of many of the, of the, of the results that we, that we have. So as I also said that after the talk, uh, there's some time for, for questions, and then after those, we fortunately get to hear from other of the researchers who, who, uh, who were in the, 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 the music lab Copenhagen, uh, because really it was a, a collaboration where, where, uh, where my wonderful colleagues were pursuing their own uh, the hypotheses that they found to be uh, the most interesting, and I was, uh, in a sense, mostly a technical coordinator who was trying to get all of this to work, because it was a very big setup, as I will uh, show you um, uh, in, in just a little bit. So the panel will be with, uh, with, uh, with those researchers, also with Solvay from the library, and then with, uh, with, I with Ian, who you just heard, and then Frederik Ueland from the, uh, from the Danish String Quartet. Okay, so... I just need to switch one thing here so I can get this going. Okay, just a bit. Very good. Okay, so the questions that we were pursuing, at least my interpretation of the questions that we were pursuing, how we can encapsulate what we were trying to do is that we were trying to understand something about musical absorption. I mean, perhaps that's not so secret that that is also what I've been trying to understand just in my own little uh, research for, for about uh, at least 10 years. Uh, um, so, so some of the questions that we have been asking and that I will try to give tentative answers to in this talk are, you know, how is musical absorption related to our empathic abilities? We, have, we may have this idea that, that, uh, that, that when we are together in the music, we are forming a very strong integrate bond to one another somehow or even to the musicians. Can we substantiate that somehow or not? Uh, which closely uh, relates to this question of whether we are creating a common zone of immersion, a big musical we or a we intentionality or a heightened form of we intentionality when we are together in this kind of concert. How does this affect our bodies? Can we, do we have any measurements that can substantiate how this affects our bodies? And then there's also a question of whether we can present the inner logic of music uh, visually. So those are some of the questions that we were, uh, were addressing. Okay. Uh, as should have been uh, very clear to you, the way that we were addressing that was uh, was uh, on the on the stage together with the with the Danish String Quartet. They were playing. Uh, uh, they chose the repertoire in 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 coordination with us. We were discussing the um, the uh, you know the order of the of the repertoire, but they basically chose the the pieces. Uh, from some of the, I mean, I think uh, some of the best, uh, uh, what they like to play the most. So a Beethoven quartet, uh, a, B, a Schnittke string quartet, then a Bach fugue, uh, and in the end, after a, a, a good break, uh, some, uh, some folk music. Um, we also, as was mentioned earlier, had an earlier uh, collaboration with a, um, a string quartet from the, from the conservatory, uh, uh, the music conservatory in, in Oslo called the Borealis String Quartet, where we were doing some comparative uh, work and they were actually coming to the concert as a kind of a, a bonus for, for participating. So that was, that was really fun. I think they had a master class also with, with the, that was with you, uh, Frederik. Um, okay, so this is an overview of the papers that have come out and that are uh, and that are coming out. Um, uh, in so in, the, in total, we're expecting twelve publications to come out of this one day of uh, of research. I think that's actually quite extraordinary that one day of research gives rise to such an extensive uh, uh, range of uh, of publications. So uh, so five of them are. Uh, are published or in press. There are two that are uh, just ready to come out with some few revisions, and that there are some that need uh, uh, more substantial revisions. Two that are not uh, not yet submitted, but that are under uh, under work. Um, 
And as has been mentioned, these uh, publications concern uh, many of the measurements we are doing. Um, they also concern you know, copyright law and open science. They concern uh, general ethical discussions of these kinds of work. Uh, so there's plenty of stuff to dig into. No matter what interest you have in music or concerts, there'll be a paper just for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and oh, I should just mention that. So the editors are, are myself and, uh, and Alexander, and then Nils, Nils Christian Hansen, um, who's currently in, in Aarhus and in Jovescula uh, uh, also. Um, Okay, so uh, let me uh, take you a little bit into the, some of the science that was that was going on here. Um, uh, part of it was uh, before the actual concert, we were doing a, a, an experiment, which was a replication of this experiment with the Borealis uh, string quartet to uh, to test the equipment of these heart rate sensors, the motion capture system. That is the system that makes all these kind of stick figures, and then uh, the eye tracking glasses. So let me just show you a short clip here. I hope it's working now. So we need to go about here. <laughs> So we're going to move now into the proper part of the experiments. So you're going to be playing the first 68 bars of Haydn, and we're going to do it five times. Each time you're going to be sitting in a different configuration. So now you can see the pressure condition where they're sitting back to back. And here there's a screen in between the first violinist and the three others. condition with, that, with an audience, a small audience. I'm curious with the concert tonight and all this gear and all this measurement, I'm curious if it's going to be possible to, to get any data that's actually useful because I feel like a lot of these feelings about the concert and the music and the performance is so vague and it's so mystical and I think it's very hard to measure. Great. So I can assure... For sure uh, the role of the science... I can assure... Esbjørn, that uh, we did get data, we did get measurements that we could use, uh, so not to worry too much. Um, so that was on the musicians' part. When we did the concert, in the beginning, uh, we had uh, less equipment, and then as we moved further on into the concert, we put more and more uh, equipment, uh, so it started to look more and more uh, uh, strange. Uh, and obviously, the, the audience could, could, uh, could notice that now things are looking really quite weird, actually. Um, when it comes to the audience, there, there were uh, two primary sources of data that we were uh, that we were recording. We had built a very extensive uh, questionnaire that was primarily with with uh, with Dana Swarbrick and Jonna Wuskowski, um, uh, but also uh, we were several people feeding into what kinds of questions would we want to to uh, to ask. So uh, you can see here that before and after the concert, and also in the breaks, the audience they had a questionnaire to fill out, and then. Um, they were equipped uh, on there. They were asked to bring their own smartphone and they downloaded the uh, Music Lab app, which taps into the gyroscope and the accelerometer such that we can get micro motion from the uh, audience. And the idea was, of course, to try to see if we can get some correlations between the experiences that they're, s that they're claiming to be having in the questionnaire and how they're actually moving. Okay. Uh, and other aspect of the science that I think is important to, me to, to mention is the interdisciplinarity, which is, uh, which is uh, quite striking. When you look at the kinds of fields that are represented among the scientists that, uh, that were doing this investigation. So we have, uh, I think I have most, I, I think I have all, but if not, then at least most of the fields. So we have library science, we have law, so copyright law, we have uh, hardcore engineering, music technology, music psychology, musicology, and music philosophy, phenomenology, ethnography, cognitive psychology, and also dynamic systems theory. And all of those fields are working together in the same time, in the same uh, place, to try to, uh, to, to bring out their perspective on this kind of uh, concert. 
Then there's a science communication, which, which uh, took an, uh, an important role, as you know. Uh, during the, the concert, I was uh, giving uh, different kinds of speeches to inform the audience both of what was going on scientifically, without trying to reveal too many hypotheses, uh, and uh, also what the, what the music was, uh, was doing. After that, there was a data jockeying uh, presentation um, um, where the audience could see uh, how their data was being analyzed. Uh, also, during the concert, we had Finn on stage to make sure that everyone was was uh, synchronizing their their devices. So there's really a citizen science component where they, this, the the um, the audience members are engaged in the scientific production and understand that they are doing that. Um, uh, also, after the data jockeying, they could talk to the uh, to the researchers or to the musicians as they as they wanted. Um, then there was, of course, the live streaming. So we had uh, many people on the live stream who could then see. Um, and we had li live radio trans transmission. There have been some podcasts produced uh, from the concert. And then there was uh, a documentary produced by the Enact Lab. Uh, the clip I just showed you before was, was from that production. Uh, you can see that on uh, Vimeo uh, called the, the Sound of Consciousness. And then, as Alexander also mentioned, um, uh, we all together uh, won uh, this uh, event of the year at the Danish uh, uh, National uh, Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, for, for this uh, really crazy uh, uh, concert uh, activity. For, for those of you uh, out there who are interested in the raw data, uh, there's also an open uh, science uh, dimension to this. So you can go on, you can log on to the Open Science Framework uh, and find the Music Lab Copenhagen data set. Uh, and there you can see all the, the raw data. Uh, if, because there, there, there's really an infinite amount of uh, hypotheses that you could that you could be pursuing with this data. It's a very valuable data set that includes the musicians' uh, 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 physiological measures and all these audience uh, uh, responses. Uh, so, so there's really much, much more that could come out of this data set than what we are just uh, uh, publishing. Okay, uh, so who... I've, I've been trying to make an overview of who we were on this project. I'm not entirely sure I have everyone, but I, I, I have at least most people. So uh, we had 18 researchers, engineers, and administration uh, on the site. Again, I cannot stress, be besides for my, for my wonderful scientific colleagues, the, the administration and engineers that we have at RITMO are just absolutely outstanding and, and working so hard for, to, to make these things happen. It's just tremendous. Um, besides for that, there, there are 10 additional authors writing the papers who are not on site. Uh, then there are the two quartets, so that's eight musicians. And then if you look at the different kinds of crews who were running the live streaming, the radio transmission, the documentary, uh, and, and working on the sites, that's at least 10 people. So we were actually 40, there's actually 46 people actively involved in making this kind of thing happen. And that's, of course, not counting the audience, which, um, which I think there was about 130 people in the audience. Not everyone chose to participate. Of course, ethically, you have the right to, to, to not give uh, your, your data if you want to. So we had 91 participating audience members who were you know, filling out the questionnaire or had their motion data recorded, and then 45 participating live streaming audience members. Okay, so now uh, let's look a little bit at, at, uh, at some of the results. Again, it's just a very brief overview of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of some of the highlights. Mm. So if you listen to a piece like a Bach fugue, it has this beautiful, rich texture of one melodic contour overlapping with the other. And, uh, and um, Olivier Latillo and, uh, and, and Carlos were trying to see is there a way that we can visualize this in a kind of in a scientifically rigorous way and use these visualizations of the structure to educate the audience about what's going on? Uh, to get the technology running for that is extremely complicated and, and, and very innovative. Um, and uh, and it did indeed, uh, we did indeed, uh, you did succeed in making the visualization run to the back view so you can see all the contours uh, uh, moving. Uh, but we also uh, found that for many of the audience members, it was distracting for them because they, fo they preferred to focus on the actual music. Uh, but in a follow-up study that was conducted online, 
uh, where you could listen to the music and then see the, the, the visualization. Um, and most of the respondents, they said that they actually did understand the musical structure better by seeing this kind of visual representation. So that is something that is a promise uh, for the future and when it comes to music education and also just educating normal people who cannot read scores about the, this rich, fantastic, almost mathematical uh, contour that there is to be found in, in the music. So that's a, another way of really appreciating uh, uh, music. Now, can we measure absorption in the musicians? I think Ian, he already uh, revealed uh, uh, some of that. And here I would, I would point to, uh, to, to my own study uh, together with, uh, with Winbo uh, uh, Yi and many, many other uh, uh, collaborators. Uh, uh, Winbo, he, uh, he did all the data analysis of the heart rate variability synchronization. He's now uh, in a PhD at, uh, at McGill and he wrote his master's dissertation on this data set and it was perhaps one of the best master dissertation ever written, I, I, I kind of uh, imagine. And the other um, uh, fantastic paper that I think uh, addresses this question is, uh, is Laura Bishop uh, uh, and, and collaborators' paper uh, uh, looking at the, the pupillometry and the, and the, and the motion uh, capture of, uh, the, again, these two different uh, quartets. And so what we find is that uh, playing, just playing, High, you know, uh, greatly increases heart rate variability synchronization, and it does so much more in the experts than uh, in the adepts from uh, from the from the conservatory. Um, and when you get pressured in the pressure conditions that you just saw in the video, uh, uh, what you see is that for the adepts, the the degree of synchronization uh, drops uh, significantly, whereas uh, for the Danish string quartets, there, there's basically no no difference. It doesn't matter how they sit. Uh, they, they seem to, rem to, to retain the same integrity, both in, in terms of how the sound is uh, and also in how, uh, how much the, the heart rate variability uh, is uh, synchronization is preserved. Um, if we look at, at, uh, at, uh, at Laura's uh, study, um, the finding was that, that adepts, they move less than experts in general when they, when they perform, and when they're pressured, they move even less. Uh, and you don't find that, uh, that effect. It seems that it doesn't matter for the Danish drink quarter whether they can see each other or not. They're all moving uh, qu quite a bit uh, uh, most of, of the time. Um, again, in contrast to the adepts, the experts, they don't need uh, visual contact for, uh, for, uh, for kind of uh, musical cohesiveness. But when they have uh, um, that contact, they enjoy it uh, perhaps even more. You can see the pupils, they dilate more when they can see each other more. Uh, so you can read about that uh, in, uh, in, in Laura's paper. Uh, so uh, to make a very grand conclusion out of these results, I would say, well, we can measure at least a proxy of, share of shared absorption uh, in uh, the musicians by looking at the heart rate variability synchronization, at the motion quantity, and at the coordination of that, of that motion. Uh, and that is, uh, to, to my knowledge, uh, entirely new to try to be able to couple some of these slightly more kind of uh, mental experiential phenomena with, uh, with physiological uh, uh, measures. And I think that that's a very promising way uh, forward. Now, did the audience get absorbed? And does that really relate to, uh, to empathy? So here's uh, in particular uh, uh, Dana Swarbrick's uh, work with all the, with the, with all the questionnaire data. Um, and uh, and here it's found that uh, on a if if you take an average on a scale from from uh, from zero to six, the, well the audience did indeed feel absorbed for for uh, for at least a, a good chunk of of the concert. Um, perhaps that's not so uh, so surprising, but it's good because it also means that the intervention that we did at least on on average was not something that disrupted their experience completely. So that's quite important because it was a big uh, kind of intervention. Um, you could also see that many of them uh, re re uh, report to lose a sense of time. It's something that we know when we are deeply focused on something, the sense of time uh, uh, you know, changes. Um, not surprisingly, uh, when you feel absorbed, you're, you're usually v uh, mostly attentive to the music, and also um, you tend to feel uh, positively transformed. Uh, that's that's kind of also, to some extent, what we'd like to know, that, that when we have... Uh, intense concert experiences, it does something to our sense of self when we come out on the, on the other end. It does something to our, to our mood. So uh, absorption is best predicted by fanship, 
not by, by empathy, there was not much of a correlation uh, um, there between trade empathy, uh, and also not to musical background. And this is, I think, important for kind of democratic purposes, that it's not true that you need to be very well trained in music, or that you need to be uh, you know, very well rehearsed in the musical genre. You can actually have uh, intense experiences with music, even if you don't have much training, um, with a slight kind of... Uh, uh, caveats that if you're a fan, uh, then you seem to be more uh, uh, absorbed. Okay, um, absorption, kamamuta, which is a new kind of uh, fancy concept that is emerging, which roughly means being moved. That and uh, and the sense of awe are all correlated. We find that uh, live attendance gives more absorption and dynamic motion than virtual attendance. I think this emphasizes a point we've just discussed that you, we have to go to live concerts if we want a good music experience. We move more dynamically with the music and with the, and the, and with the musicians, and we report that we have more absorbed experiences than when we're just sitting in our couch. Um, okay, so do we form then a, a, a shared zone of absorption? That's one of the main uh, questions. It was actually extremely difficult to, uh, to, to operationalize that question and find ways of matching uh, a musician's physiology with that of the of the audience, uh, but uh, but I think that uh, that uh, what Finn Upham uh, did, what you did Finn, with uh, basically synchronizing each audience member's uh, uh, micro motion, uh, uh, it, it was just an incredible uh, effort, um, and and the commentary in a sense of the, the analysis that we're getting from uh, from someone like Nanette Nielsen and and Remy Martin on how to interpret uh, this response in the audience to the music are, are, are just kind of outstanding pieces of, uh, of uh, scholarship. So I'm going to show you a, a graph that, 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 that Finn has, has produced, where on the, uh, on the green, um, the green uh, uh, curve is the, is, the, is the music, and the black one is the average uh, quantity of motion uh, in, the, in the audience. First, a couple of seconds of slight silence. Maybe you can turn up the volume a little bit. Great. So, this is uh, what uh, what Finn up and what what we call uh, the stilling effect. Um, uh, basically, what what we see is uh, when you do a more systematic inquiry, uh, you find that uh, that with the breaks or silences in the music, the audience are displaying a kind of uh, freezing response, uh, where the average quantity of motion drops very rapidly uh, uh, for for a short uh, period. Um, it, it seems that, uh, that musicians are, are, are aware of having a, a contact with the audience in moments of silence. Um, the more silent the audience is, the more engaged they're perceived to be. Uh, and this is very enriching and very important. We also all know this, I mean, this, uh, this sense of sitting in a concert and when a piece ends, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a condensed uh, uh, atmosphere and everyone is kind of waiting and sitting in this, in this moment of silence. And I think that, that, uh, that what, uh, what, what, uh, what Finn has done is to, 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 prove, to quantify that to, to some extent. Um, so we could say, I think, that through this, re this response and, and, and exactly in understanding how to frame what, is it a response, is it a co-constitution of the music, that is what, uh, what Remy Martin and Ned Nielsen are, are discussing in that uh, wonderful uh, paper. But we could say that the audience are participating in the music uh, and are establishing a communicative s uh, system of shared absorption. So they're not passive when they're sitting still. In the kind of stillness that they're sitting in, they are, they are participating through kind of degrees of, of stillness and in that way co-constituting together with the musicians they're performing together. So the, the idea that if you're just a kind of a passive recipient in a, in a music uh, concert, that, that then you're not engaged enough or you're not participating enough, uh, I, I think we can, we can say with this, kind of with this kind of data that that's not true. Uh, you are definitely 
uh, participating, but the, but the kind of participation has a different shape than we might have expected. Um, and so this stillness response, I think, is extremely promising to look at uh, uh, what exactly does it mean? Are we processing information in a particularly condensed form? Or um, I mean, there's, there's a lot there to, uh, to, to look at, so I'm very excited for, for that paper to, uh, to come out. Okay, so if we uh, overall try to conclude the ch uh, ch uh, you know, gains and challenges of this kind of uh, research, then I'd, I'd recommend looking at, uh, at, um, uh, at Solvay's uh, and, and colleagues' uh, uh, paper on the open science and the library aspect of data sharing and open access and the legal aspects of that. And I'd also point you to uh, Anna Danielson and his Christian Hansen's uh, paper that, are, that is trying to, to somehow conclude on the pros and cons of these kinds of, of results. And there's a lot to be, to be said, so, so let me just mention a, a few uh, points. So as you, uh, as you all heard, there's this aspect of, of kind of radical interdisciplinarity and, 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 and very wide range of, of scientific um, disciplines involved. And that uh, can inspire, I think, can inspire fresh thinking, but it can also lead to a lot of complexity in how to communicate together where the same word can mean different things or different words can mean the same thing. Um, and, uh, and, and that can lead to quite a bit of, of frustration also. So you need a lot of time in a group to communicate together. Uh, and and uh, and and work together. And if you don't have that time of, of communication, I'm not sure that we even had nearly time enough. Um, uh, but 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 so so that is really a, a challenge uh, that that needs to be recognized for for what it is. Uh, I think another uh, ch challenge um, that should be mentioned is, is the kind of high cost and high risk aspect of something like this. It's ex it's very expensive to uh, to do. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the actual cost of, of, of getting there and getting f flying everyone in and some is, is uh, I mean, is, is, is perhaps manageable, but the amount of time for all the researchers to write all the papers uh, uh, and, and also the, the work for, for, for the quartet to raise the money for their, uh, for their uh, you know, for their, for their concerts, all of this um, together takes a very kind of high-powered research institution. You cannot do it with a very small number of, uh, of people. So you need a research institution with a very tight organization and a lot of money. Uh, and then there is this kind of high-risk uh, aspect to it that, that I think now that we have found some really valuable results, but it also could have been to a large extent that we wouldn't have. Um, it also could have been that a lot of the technology would not really have worked, even in spite of, of all the testing. And of course, there was technology that didn't work optimally. There was data loss. Uh, but I think it was, it was not critical uh, uh, data loss. But this is a real risk. Uh, so are you willing to spend a lot of money on something that could potentially kind of fail rather miserably? Uh, that's something you have to take into consideration, right? Um, then uh, a very important aspect that I would like for all of us to reflect on is this kind of class of values between the artists and the scientists. So to say very roughly, uh, for artists you find truth in beauty, and for scientists we find truth in knowledge. And these two, they are not often very compatible. So when, when scientists they go up on stage and start kind of co-performing with the musicians, the, the aesthetic elements are greatly reduced. And so there's a, there's a conflict, and the audience uh, members uh, uh, obviously noted this. There were some audience members who were kind of infuriated that, uh, the, that the science took so much presence uh, in this. And so the, the communication with the, with the audience and with the artists, we could have, have spent longer to prepare together. Could we have found ways where the scientists could have been more the science could have been more aesthetic, or where the science could have been less invasive. Those are really important uh, uh, points. Um, also, when when audience members are paying uh, a ticket, they're paying a good price to come, and they expect back to see a nice show, and then they see all kinds of scientists running around <laughs> together with the musicians. Is that is that ethically okay? Is it not? Th those are important considerations. Um, what I think is very positive is that. Audience members uh, get a real picture of science, so they see all the messiness and all the fumbling around, uh, and all the the errors and the hesitations that that you were also uh, uh, addressing, and all the uncertainty. Um, for the knowledge dissemination and sharing, uh, I think there's a very good lesson for for libraries and and uh, and research libraries that they can actually greatly help 
with the science communication. They can help with the, with the knowledge management and the writing up of data management plans because those are really complex. So the organization of knowledge and, and data is something that libraries can really help with. And it was kind of immensely helpful to work with, with, this, with Solvay and with Matthew also. Uh, another thing that's great is that even if we had made, uh, as Ian mentioned, some, some kind of methodological reductions, we're working with a real concert with very, very good musicians. Uh, so we have what we call a very high degree of ecological validity. And I'm sure that, uh, that some of these uh, findings we wouldn't have had if we had had, uh, you know, even a concert where people were sitting behind uh, tables and sitting on chairs and, and uh, with, with measurement uh, equipment and, and filling out questionnaires. Being in something that is a concert hall with real musicians uh, is of incredible value uh, in and of itself. Then, uh, as I think as I've just demonstrated, uh, there are several uh, kind of groundbreaking uh, findings that we have uh, managed to, to generate all together. Uh, and then I can only say for myself that it's, it's just extremely exciting kind of work to do uh, that, that you can enable a, a platform where uh, people, of course, under, under s certain constraints, can pursue the hypotheses that they find to be interesting. Um, what that leads to is that people are willing to work uh, kind of very hard and <laughs> maybe uh, too much on, on, uh, on refining their, their results and, 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 and it gives a lot of, of pleasure and, uh, and kind of, um, you know, drive to work together in, in, in that way. And, uh, and it's been kind of an, an a great, great pleasure to, to, to work, I mean, theoretically with so many of you, but also in putting cables and, and finding out what, wh who of you are vegan, or I mean, all these kind of things that we do on a practical level that brings you together and gives so much joy in the work that, that, uh, that we do uh, is, is really exciting. So I think with, uh, with those uh, uh, kind of evaluating words, uh, I, will, I will just think... Uh, uh, all of you uh, so much for that we could do this uh, together. Um, I, I mean, and that there's so many people who to to, uh, to to thank the the amazing musicians who who uh, who, who let us do this, uh, and who spent so many hours collaborating in meetings to discuss back and forth. Um, all the amazing uh, uh, colleagues who have written and discussed and worked out data kind of uh, tirelessly. Um, and then the amazing uh, uh, engineers and um, and administrative staff that we that we have here, uh, who even came all the way to to Copenhagen to to help out, and then all the the, the people who work also behind the scenes on the on the radio, uh, the, the 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 DSQ photographer Caroline Bitoncourt who takes these amazing black and white photos. Uh, so there's so many people to uh, to uh, to thank, um, and. Um, and I think that's actually about it for uh, for me now. We have uh, we have a little bit of time for uh, for questions, and then we have the the panel afterwards. So uh, yes, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. How did you even th uh, thought of the idea of doing this, this type of, of concert? So because it's, it's a lot of work, and even if, if I was uh, not as involved as uh, some of the other people, it was a lot of, of work and preparation, uh, including uh, COVID and, and everything. Uh, but so th the idea was there even before COVID. Uh, so then how did you come up to Um, yeah, I think uh, something like this it could only happen through a, a, a many kind of very serendipitous kind of events and uh, and moments. Um, so uh, I have uh, you know a very strong friendship with uh, with with Frederick from the from the quartet, uh, and and I also know the others from the quartet very well through through all the work that I've done uh, uh, already. Um, 
and and I think we have built uh, a kind of a sense of mutual trust over over many many uh, years. So I've been used to working with them for my for my uh, humanistic uh, research, and then I think when I came to Ritmo and I I, I heard about uh, one of these music labs and I went uh, to 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 one of those just after I had come. And and uh, and saw it, and I was like, "What? What is going on here? This is really weird." Uh, but it but it helped build some kind of idea. And at some point, there was uh, some word of research concert that kind of uh, beeped into my to my uh, to my mind. And then it just built uh, little by little of talking to uh, to the various people. Well, so so I was talking with Olivier. So Olivier, would it be interesting for you to build some kind of visualization? Because I know that's kind of what you're doing. We were sitting next to each, to each other in the office. Would it be interesting to build some kind of visualization for the music? Because the quartet, they would like to have something that looks very fancy. And Olivier was like, yeah, maybe we could do that. That should be possible. And, and, and with each of, of, uh, of you, there were these kind of conversations about what could be interesting to, uh, to do. And then it just kind of built gradually from, uh, from, from there. So it's very kind of serendipitous, I, I, I think. Yeah, but of course, I mean, it should also be mentioned. I think that that there are, of course, uh, other groups who are doing similar work in in McMaster uh, and in and in and in Frankfurt. Uh, uh, they're doing uh, concert uh, research that, you know, so I've met some of the people there, and I've seen also in 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 the Max Planck in Frankfurt they have built a concert hall as a as a laboratory, and I saw that one. I was like, oh, that's very interesting that they're doing that. I wonder what it does. What is the difference between you know, going. What is the difference between going to a to a concert in a concert hall where the researchers are coming with the gear, or going into a concert hall that is in a university laboratory? Is there? I, I don't know, right? But so so these kinds of uh, little inspirations are coming from uh, from uh, from from here and there. Yeah. So uh, I'm a bit curious to know what is your opinion or how, you know, this is, in a way, you are an interdisciplinary man working in a very interdisciplinary environment. But if you now go back full circle to phenomenology, how do you think that this work informs the other or vice versa? Mm. Yeah, thank you, Bruno. Um, yeah, I guess I should start also by by acknowledging that that I really wish we had had time to do uh, interviews uh, uh, with the Danish String Quartet when we had the the, the concert. Uh, but again, because of uh, Corona, we had to squeeze kind of the equivalent of five days into into uh, into one day where we had sh we were shooting a documentary at the same time that we were doing an experiment and preparing for the for the concert. It was a really really crazy uh, uh, day. Um, so I would have wanted to to carry that qualitative aspect uh, with me into that, but but uh, but it got kind of squeezed out. Um, but to answer your question more directly, I think so. In in phenomenology, uh, as a study of 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 the mind and its structures, recognizes centrally the role of bodily self-consciousness. It's absolutely central in order to understand what it means to be a human being, uh, to understand how our perception works. To in order to do that, you need to understand the ways that we are embodied. Uh, sociality and intersubjectivity are also uh, co-constituents of subjectivity as such. You cannot understand what it means to be a subject without understanding uh, intersubjectivity. Those are core foundations in theory in, in phenomenology, as you find it in, in Husserl, in Merleau-Ponty, and in that whole uh, lineage. So I think that what we are finding in some of this, in these uh, physiological measurements, are very good bodily signals. And these bodily signals say something about our bodily self-consciousness. Right? When we see the way that audiences are doing micro-movements together, in response to musical structure, then we are seeing an aspect of the intersubjective embodied mind in action. Uh, we actually don't, and to some extent, we don't even need to ask people in a questionnaire or even in an interview how, whether they feel together or not, because we can, we can see it in that data. 
uh, ideally, I think it would be wonderful to couple the data sources so we get rich qualitative desc uh, descriptions of concert experiences coupled with the, with the physiological measurements. But I think that, uh, that these measurements in the, in the pupillometry, in the heart rate variability synchronization, in the movement synchronization, that, uh, that those are uh, images of pre-reflective consciousness, things of which we are not aware but that are deeply structuring the way that we think and the way that we find ourselves together in the world. And so I see them as entirely compatible at a theoretical level. The problem is the methodology of making them compatible. This is, this is the hardest knot to, to crack. I don't think we're even close to, to that yet. But theoretically, it, it's, uh, I think it's almost unproblematic to see uh, that, that the core tenets of phenomenology of pointing to pre-reflective, intersubjective, embodied experience is uh, continuous with the kinds of measurements we can do in a concert. Um, I see that perhaps we should move on to the, um, the panel discussion now. So let's uh, thank of Simon now here. <laughs> the panel members to come up here um, on stage. Yes, there. I'll, I'll be the outsider. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly suitable. No, no, no. I just <laughs> sit somewhere. Yeah, here, there. Let's see. Um, so the, here we have a fantastic panel. Um, Laura Bishop from uh, from Ritmo, um, Fina Pam from Ritmo, Remy Martin from Ritmo, Solveig uh, Sörbe from uh, the library, uh, Ian Cross that you have all seen from the University of Cambridge, and Frederik Erland from the Danish String Quartet. And now uh, the way we're doing this is that we um, all of you will have a kind of a short introduction statement, um, and then uh, we will go into some some more discussion. And um, we also have some time for discussions or questions from the from the audience, including the online audience. So if you do have questions, then type it into the chat. That uh, that's the best. Uh, so why don't we start on this side, um, Laura? Okay. Um, yes. So. I guess I can start by talking a little bit about my role in this project. Um, so I was leading parts of the research that focused on the musicians on the DSQ. Um, Simon introduced this a bit, but um, I guess that the structure that we had here was that there was the, the concert, which is the main event, but we also had this separate study that we did with the DSQ on the morning of the event. And here we were able to take um, a look at how the musicians performed um, a particular piece, which we had them perform multiple times. And we used a variety of different measures, um, looking at their body motion, their eye gaze patterns, of course the audio, and pupil size as a measure of attention. And we were able to bring all of these measures together, in a way, to say something about um, their particular way of playing, um, how their bodies kind of interact with each other as they're playing together, the, the attention strategies that they use as they're playing, um, kind of their use of, of visual communication and also their ability to adapt to performance conditions that are not necessarily what they are used to. And I think perhaps one of the points that I would make in my short introduction um, is that this is potentially a very useful way of doing this kind of research where you, you have an event and you need to kind of negotiate some of the scientific goals as well as the artistic goals and combine these in a way. Um, so what we were able to do in this case was have the concert where we had gave a bit more priority to the artistic goals and then this study component, which was not so public, um, and we were able to then prioritize some of the scientific goals. Um, so this is a potential way of negotiating this. Um, is that probably three minutes? So maybe, maybe one more point? I guess the other the other kind of scientific points that I would make here um, it kind of builds a little bit on what's one thing that Ian said earlier, which is talking about what's what the DSQ needs to do in order to in order to perform. Um, one thing that I think we can capture in this kind of circumstance where we're trying to capture performance more naturalistically is to look at the question of what musicians need to do in order to play versus what they do when they're playing. And for example, this, these findings that we had with whether or not they are looking at each other and how important this is. 
and this is something that they don't need to do, but it is something that they do anyway. And so that raises many interesting questions about why they do these things, even if they don't seem to need to do them. <laughs> then I will leave on that point. <laughs> That's a, a really good point in terms of what do people do, whether they need to or not. Um, at which uh, uh, my, my role in this experiment was oriented mostly towards the audience in trying to capture their movement and then make sense of whatever we got in the process of <laughs> after having gotten them to install a thing on their phones and wear a thing around their neck and tap on their phones at particular times. And as much as we talk about trying to make a, a naturalistic kind of uh, experiment, um, asking things of an audience explicitly is a pretty big disruption for a classical music audience. Uh, and so um, in, in, and, and uh, because I joined this study, kind of, oh, I, a lot of the work was all underway when I got began to come in, involved. Um, we kind of had to do a sort of scramble to figure out how to get them the devices and what we're going to do to make sure that we could synchronize signals. Um, and the demand of knowing the concert was happening in a month and having to solve all these things certainly made a lot of stuff possible. I wouldn't say it's optimal, everything that we did, um, but um, it was a great opportunity. And yesterday I was giving a talk to uh, biostatistics and, and epidemiology, and uh, I kind of had the excitement of sharing with them uh, a kind of data that comes from having a need to explore. As we try to look at musical experiences in this kind of more rich environment, we have an opportunity to step back and say, wait, let's not just go by our previous hypotheses, let's see what kind of structures this data contains because there's all kinds of things that are outside of our immediate conscious kind of monitoring of these experiences. And so to participate in this kind of research is really just a great opportunity to actually see new things out of very familiar and practiced kind of behaviors. Um, by the way, I'm Finn Upham, and, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's, I think, mostly what I wanted to bring initially to this conversation. So here's Remy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I joined the party quite late as well, actually, to this. Um, in fact, I started my research post at Ritmo a matter of weeks before the actual event, and I certainly was notified quite late on in the design of the the questionnaires and some of the kind of phenomenological concerns that uh, we had and what we could achieve at the concert. Um, as a musicologist with a deep uh, interest in phenomenology, this certainly felt like radical interdisciplinarity. Dazzling array of devices, um, uh, questions, approaches were being used, uh, new to me, many of them as well. So stepping out into the extremely funky and complex world of wild music, um, if we're going to go with radical interdis interdisciplinarity, we can go with wild music now. <laughs> a slight reformulation, actually, of Ian's title, but I'll take that. Um, uh, the, data, the data concerned, uh, scientists might call that noisy, actually. This funky wildness um, is noisy. And to get back to the music, my goodness, Frederick, some of that schnitker and folk was funky, definitely. And um, to see how such varied data collection could take place within a single event is a remarkable thing to observe, particularly if you're new to this. Um, in my experience, the opportunities and challenges to a pro like project like this go hand in hand as well. This is captured well in uh, Anna Thayer's and Nielis' article on the gains and challenges of radical dis inter interdisciplinarity. Our attempt to combine phenomenological and music psychology uh, approaches in the service of audience absorption is a use useful case study for reflecting on how difficult this is to do together, actually. It required overcoming differences in language, in methodological concerns, in both the study design and data analysis phases, conceptual clarification was an issue. It still is, actually. <laughs> and that's OK. That's totally OK. This is rumbling on, this discussion. Differences in academic style at the writing process are also uh, of interest to me as well. The push and pull of theory also shaped the discussion in interesting, way interesting ways. Despite this, uh, much was gained uh, from reaching out and across these boundaries of our respective fields. Hopefully a richness and novelty to the work which comes out of these struggles. Um, so there's my uh, confession, I suppose. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm Solvaya and I represented the library. I was very happy that I was able to join as well as part of the team going to Copenhagen. And my most vivid memory, I think, is from hanging a GoPro camera in the chandelier. <laughs> But I think I did a little bit more than that. Uh, <laughs> so, and also um, 
my colleagues and I have seen this as an opportunity to to do research support. I mean, obviously, libraries are very far now from being storages of books. I mean, we have moved past that uh, across um, and yeah, centuries. Uh, and now increasingly doing uh, research support. But how to do research support is a, is a huge question. And uh, one of the suggestions is to be very close to emergent data communities. And I'd say that uh, RITMA with its incredible indis uh, interdisciplinarity and everything is an indeed some kind of an emergent, emerging uh, data community. So it's very useful to, to develop and to co-evolve, um, that librarianship can co-evolve with, uh, with research. Um, and being really embedded to the point that I'm there actually assisting with uh, everything. Um, my colleagues have helped a lot as well with um, developing the data management plans. And one of the things that we have learned, um, obviously that was done with Kayla Burnham and, and a lot of you as well, but um, Matthew Good and Liva Kvala participated in it heavily as well. And one of the things that they learned, I think, was just how incredibly important it is to have a good data management plan before you start collecting uh, research data. I mean, a lot of things are hindered by legal issues if you don't identify them early, for instance, GDPR, and uh, also copyright protection because we're working with art. And then when art becomes data, then you have a huge problem because they work on entirely different dynamics. Um, and systems that have been placed uh, in order to protect artists and their intellectual work don't really go well with the ethos of open science. We have like huge problems here, and that's why Matthew as well um, created this workshop where we talk with a lot of people who deal with the same kinds of, of uh, challenges, and a lot of things um, need to be addressed and solved, and this is just uh, one part of it. Um, also, I just wanted to mention that, you know, there's a lot of talks about, um, you know, bridging the gaps between um, um, what the individual experience of the music and the researchers, the phenomolo phenomenological part, and then the hard data. And I was actually, I thought that as a librarian, one of my duties is to try to communicate not only um, science, but also research. That's why we're in it from the beginning. We want to communicate re research itself, because to have the whole life cycle of things. And I went in the radio and I said, we are now bridging the gap. <laughs> Um, we are now finding out, you know, the researchers are finding out what is uh, happening, uh, really happening in people, in people's minds. Uh, and this is the hard data that's going to prove it. I think I promised a little bit too much. <laughs> but, um, but certainly, yeah, maybe that's the good thing about having a, a somebody who is not a researcher talking the radio, because then I can really get people excited and worked up. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, yeah, that's enough for now. Thank you. Well, I think I've probably spoken enough, but all, I, all I'd like to say is fabulous. I mean, the sheer amount of effort and, frankly, a wee bit of luck in putting the whole thing together and keeping it flying for just long enough to take the snapshots that you did is fabulous. Just congratulations. Well, uh, and then there's me, the, the weird one. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thank you uh, to everyone here for uh, making this incredible, thank you to you, Simon, for making this incredible thing fly, uh, in spite of uh, people like me <laughs> that are crazy uh, musicians. I'm humbled by the uh, clever minds that surround me r right now. Uh, I think you said, Ian, uh, humans are more social than uh, bright. I think that's particularly the case in, uh, with me. Uh, I lost more in the bright department than I gained in the social department, but. But uh, so apologies uh, for, for if any, I, I've never been to an event where there's so many new words. <laughs> it's crazy. I've understood very much less than I thought I would. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, so this um, little thing will also be taking the whole, <laughs> I'll be dragging you all down, so to say. Um, but I want to I wanna talk just briefly a little bit about the, the background. There was a question uh, before, like how did this whole thing uh, come to pass and how was it realized? Um, I think it, um, like Simon said, Simon and I are, are very close friends and have been for many, many years. Um, and uh, when we were emotional teenagers, we met in Simon's apartment, in, uh, Simon's mom's apartment actually. <laughs> And uh, for everybody who knows Simon, there's always a really nice bottle of red wine within arm's reach. Um, that was the case back then. Uh, so we were sitting there sharing a bottle, I think, 
and listening to music. And uh, because we shared an interest in this, uh, we were both passionate about music and, um, and actually also um, about philosophy. So we were having these wonderful deep and uh, emotional teenage style discussions about music and life and all this stuff. And, and this question started to emerge, what happens uh, to us when we listen to music and uh, what happens when we perform music and it's going really well. And, um, and we were talking about that f uh, a lot. And then I found out that Simon wanted to pursue that even further and that he wanted, uh, at least to a certain degree, us to be the guinea pigs. I got really scared because, uh, like it's been touched upon many times already, what would happen if we found out that there was nothing to find? <laughs> and knowing my own mind, I would, that was a really real thing that, <laughs> you know, there might not be anything in there. Um, which is something that I'm always a little bit scared of, but um, but 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 we uh, nonetheless, Simon was a you know a passionate guy, and he started working on this, and we had these we continued our emotional discussions basically uh, for many years, and when I look back now and I read through some of the old um, interviews and these quotes that I gave, I it it's it's cringe worthy what I say. Um, but I do feel like that I, uh, I have some of the same ideas now, but they're more, I say more because they're not, but they're more refined now than they were back then. And that's because of this, actually, in part, I'm sure. Um, we had these wonderful talks, and I think that the, the clip that you showed, Simon, before, with uh, Espion, who said he was, he was very much in doubt that if you would get any data from this. I think that's a perfect clip because we musicians, we, we tend to think of our trade as something slightly uh, magical. Um, if you, if in order to understand music, you have to go to Hogwarts or something. It's a little bit like that. Um, it, it, and it, it definitely has some, some almost magical um, qualities to it. And, um, and, and if or when asked about them, we have a huge, very, very hard time answering uh, anything co cohes cohes cohesible. I don't know what that word is. That's, you know, low IQ thing. I, I'm dragging you down. Um, but, but, but this did improve. And, um, and what I, I've been thinking a lot about it recently because I'm, we're, we're all teaching now at the uh, academy in, in Copenhagen, which is a huge joy and pleasure but also a big responsibility. And, um, and now when, we, when playing an instrument, playing music is, we think of it maybe especially when we're young, we think of it as something magical, right? And if something doesn't work when we are in concert, it's because the stars are not aligned. Um, but, but there's this whole, like the, the, the whole building structure beneath it is in our case, a lot of, there's some, it's a physical trait, but it's also a very, very mental state uh, trait. And, um, and now when I'm teaching, I'm, um, I'm, I'm very consciously talking to them about this mental state because um, we tend to be in a slightly fear-based world, the, the music, or us musicians, we're very much afraid to make mistakes. Um, and we were talking about this, the, the f getting into a nice flow. Um, I can tell you being frightened is a really, is a good flow stopper, if you can, it might say. Um, and, and it's also a really bad way to figuring out who you are as a musician. If you're ba uh, trying to avoid mistakes or trying to be somebody else, basically. Be, trying to be a recording uh, in some ways. Um, and the wonderful thing is when you, if you get into a flow, th part of that is actually accepting that you will make mistakes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part of it. But the wonderful thing is if you get into that and accept that you will make mistakes, you will actually make few, uh, fewer mistakes, right? So it's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this is just to say that this is one of the things that personally I got out of it. I cannot speak for the scientific research in the same way that you all can, but I can, I can talk on, on my behalf and I can speak on the musician's behalf. This is something that we got out of it, this, this, the thoughtfulness 
the, the provoking that made us think. Uh, and that's something that we can pass on. And I think that has, um, I can see that when it works with my students, then it makes for not only better musicians, but it makes for more uh, healthy human beings, actually. Because they're, they're more uh, comfortable within their own uh, abilities, and they're more comfortable in their own uh, person, actually. So I think this is something that's hugely Im important, and that I hope that uh, there will be more research like this, that because this is something that we need a lot of. And uh, just to wrap it up, I think uh, we, we, we all see, um, you, you touched upon it as well, we see cuts on, on culture. Yeah. Um, if, if everybody knew the stuff that you know now, then I'm not sure that would be the case. And I think that needs to come out there. This is, it's not, it, it's not only something that pleases us, right, Art? It's something that's actually healthy uh, to, to our minds and to our uh, social ability. So, um, and finally, I, <laughs> just, I was in another panel, a musician's panel, where I felt more at home, I gotta say. <laughs> but uh, I, th there was one question from a, a young student who asked, what do you think of when you play? And I, I thought, yes, I got, I, I got this one in the bag. <laughs> and I started answering, and it, it became a huge mess. And it was something like, uh, well, you need to think, you need to prepare, obviously. But then when you get to the concert, you, don't, you have to not think at all. But at the same time, you should think it on everything. <laughs> right? so, so I think uh, research has been done, but you can safely do more because we need it. So thank you. To this, uh, oh, here we have a lot of sound. Is that okay? Yep. It's uh, here and there. Um, just checking that it's uh, under control. Um, so back to this uh, interdisciplinarity concept and the radical radicality that uh, Remy talked about and the wildness, <laughs> perhaps of this. Um, the uh, talking about doing this type of uh, music research in the wild, uh, kind of it sounds like then that we're comparing this to something else, and and there are other ways of doing research too. I mean, more traditional, perhaps music analytical approaches, um, uh, lab-based research that we have been doing, observation-based stuff. I mean, and then then this is kind of massive data collection thing that we did here. But uh, what what are some of the kind of the uh, well, there are certainly challenges of doing this type of research, but but uh, what would be the benefits of doing some of the other ones? And and also um, uh, because we we could have done more of these other types of music research as well um, in here. Um, I'm not sure if Remy wants to answer this or some of the other um, researchers here. Start, gosh. Uh, gosh, it's a relief, firstly, to hear there's an exchange here between <laughs> musicians and seriously, it's such a relief yeah, and blessing too. Um, what can we learn from this naturalistic research concert in comparison or against something that's much more familiar to me, actually, as a background, which is what we call close readings of music, with music texts. Many people have been working with scores in musicology. Uh, I've been working with recordings, mainly, with a popular music background. Um, and there are lots of differences. The first thing, and I've done a list, actually, so strap in, here we go. Uh, first, it, with a concert naturalistic in the wild music setting, makes us think, I think, rather than an artifact, like a recording or a text, as we traditionally call it, we have to think of ecology, the whole environment of this. As soon as you step in the room, as a researcher or an audience member, you know you are in a funky, wild environment with so many variables, so much that um, the performance studies scholar Martin Barker would call an aliveness to that room, which you're driving, you're leading, but the audience are doing so much as, as well, as you commented on. So ecology rather than artifact is what it makes us think. Secondly, it, uh, concert research or in the wild or event research makes us, as researchers or particularly in a more traditional musicology way, completely reorientate our subject position. Traditional uh, analysis of music recording of the kind I've kind of done in the past, my subject position is in that musical text and it's mainly mine. <laughs> 
a researcher in a concert environment, it is not about your subject position, it's about your intersubjective position. You're suddenly not in the text yourself, you're amongst the room of people musicking. I have to give a nod to my colleague, Nanette Nielsen, for putting that really neatly for me when I was fumbling my way through this idea in a conversation the other day. Not the subject position, this intersubjective position. Um, we're, we're forced to confront liveness in a concert in a way Kind of a solitary musicologist like myself working at the score or at the recording isn't involved in liveness. In previous work, I've commented on the liveness of sounds or as an aesthetic judgment. Liveness here is about this rich ecology of activity. Uh, material forces, sonic forces, bodies as forces in that room suddenly is completely different in terms of liveness. Um, also, interpretation. What are we to interpret here? A traditional musicology close reading is what you work out what this song means, what this piece means. That's not so straightforward in the concert. Where on earth is meaning to be interpreted, found out, discussed? Um, there's much to gain phenomenologically, I think, from this in the wild. That's kind of an unsurprising, obvious point here. It's a vital uh, opportunity to capture aspects of audience uh, experience. So many of them we've managed to kind of start to confront and make contact with. Again, as... as uh, enabled by this dazzling array of devices and approaches and questions asked at Music Lab Copenhagen. But there are also challenges to this in the wild, in the concert. Note to be how to get rich reports. Seaman has mentioned at several points the qualitative, perhaps, limitation of, of what we've achieved here, which is something I think is important. How do we get these rich reports um, of temporal, affective, transformative experience um, very hard to get, actually, still, without extremely rich reports. Yeah. This is con a concerning example of what um, Professor Cross earlier described as the what we don't know. And that's really important, I think, we confront that. Uh, final few things, I promise. In the concert setting, bodies are very apparent, such an obvious point to make, um, a vital one. Embodiment, of course, has been the concern f uh, in more traditional, should we say, uh, musicology readings of scores and recordings, but my gosh, bodies are present in a way in this setting for researchers we just have to confront. And bodies that are enacting musical aesthetics, as you said, not passively receiving. Um, uh, final one, concert research provides a serious challenge to representational tendencies in musicology, whether it's of the visual uh, or of the abstract. We have got to, lived, we've got to live with the live reality of this concert experience. Um, finally, concert research is an opportunity to consider really rich forms of musical consciousness. This makes obvious the kind of perceptual dynamism, multiplicity, uh, and vitality of musicking between musicians and audiences as well. There's an interesting interaction with theory here as well. Empirical findings should be allowed to challenge theoretical frameworks. Theoretical frameworks, on the other hand, may also help us uh, gain further insight into the kind of findings we're getting in these events too. So, But the main thing is we are in an extremely rich environment which takes a lot of careful consideration and not to, to lose that holistic view of it for me, I think. Sorry for rambling. <laughs> um, to be substantially more specific, but not as broad, um, there's a, a couple of things that I see as being very special about this particular experiment. Having been involved in attempts to have concert experiments of various types before, uh, one thing that was really distinctive about this was the authenticity of the audience and the commitment of the audience to the performer. And so much of our most intensive concert experience and musical experiences are when we have an investment in the music and an investment in who is performing. I'm, I'm speaking from a listener, but even as a musician also, kind of your best experiences are with your best crowds, right? You know, there's a hometown advantage in that kind of effect. Um, and that is incredibly difficult to recreate in a laboratory condition. You just don't get the same people. And so uh, and this is a, a fundamental, essential aspect of why we engage in concerts, and yet we cannot capture it with anything less than the involvement of uh, artists that are performing at the, you know, the top of their game and, and an audience that is ready to engage, then maybe we're not prepared for this particular type of scientific experimentation, but at least we're willing enough to play along for us to get a view into a very special and not necessarily unique, but uh, uh, important extreme in how we experience music and why we engage in music. And um, 
I, I think there's a lot of other questions that we can ask in more sort of controlled conditions, and that'll be easier to see under controlled conditions, but there are certain kinds of phenomena that just don't exist without these kinds of intensive, demanding, and special events. So I guess I would, I would say that um, taking this kind of research where you, you look in detail at a concert, a concert is a unique event that happens within a specific context, um, and it cannot be really replicated um, outside of the context in which it, it happens. And this is both a good thing and a, a bad or a difficult thing um, for doing research. So coming from the a background of music psychology, um, I find it difficult in some ways to find ways to address the research questions that I have within the confines of a concert. Normally in a psychological experiment, you, you have replication or you have contrasts that you design into your experiment. So you see how the person behaves in this case and you see how they perform in, in this case. And then you can compare those. And that's something you have to look for opportunities in concert data to make those kinds of comparisons. Um, so that's, I would say, one, one way in which this is challenging. Um, but one of the perhaps most useful things that can come out of this is that it gives us, so th the fact that this the concert is a unique experience um, gives us sometimes the opportunity to look at what happens when things, in your case, in cases where things go very well, um, in the case of the student Quartet. It also went very well for the students, but there was was one unexpected um, error um, that came up when somebody missed a page turn, and that that's something that you wouldn't necessarily see in a, an experiment, um, and you cer cer certainly wouldn't be able to look at how the how the musicians respond to something like this when there's the pressure of an audience. If you're trying to to do this just with a couple of people in the lab, um, and so I think this. Yeah, th this um, gives you the opportunity to kind of step away from the tradition that we tend to have in psychology of focusing on the general case, kind of the average case or the, the typical events that tend to occur, and actually take into consideration the unique context that surrounds each performance, because there's not really an, a normal way of performing music. And this, uh, so when you have people perform music in the lab under experimental circumstances, often you, you might actually make them play the same piece a couple of times until they give you something without errors, for example. And then this, this becomes your idea of what a normal performance is that you're trying to study. But actually, that's not necessarily a normal performance. Maybe the normal performance has errors. Maybe it has um, yeah, things that go wrong or things that go particularly right in some cases. Um, and and also to say that the this kind of uh, page turn error actually turned into a paper on its own. <laughs> so that kind of that's an also an interesting thing there. But I, I wanted to um, perhaps to start going back to you, Laura, um, about setting up for an experiment as we did in in this uh, because you were also part of planning this from the beginning. And um, then uh, one of the things that we, from a research perspective, wanted was to try to uh, conceal the technology as much as possible. I mean, we, we, we did wanted this to be as normal as possible for the musicians and for the audience. Uh, so that was our primary wish. But then also talking about, as Simon mentioned, also the kind of the negotiation between the artists and, and us as researchers. Uh, so in fact, the Danish String Quartet, I mean, you wanted to put on some stuff and show that this was a research thing, right? So, so in the end, uh, you did have a full, <laughs> full package with motion capture and eye tracking and whatnot. Uh, and that was like an aesthetic element also for you, um, which was uh, interesting for us too, but perhaps uh, kind of we, I guess we got more data out of the beginning of the concert than, than the end because of, of kind of the special setting that this was. So I'm not sure if, if uh, well, Laura, perhaps first comment on, on kind of some of the ideas behind uh, kind of the technologies we used, and then perhaps Freddie can follow up on some of the aesthetics of show, showing the technology afterwards. Yeah, I think um, the idea of bringing an entire uh, motion capture sets came up pretty early. Um, we we're a little bit uh, doubtful of that at, at first, but then it, it turned out that you guys were were quite enthusiastic about dressing up and 
and <laughs> showing stuff. Um, so we, we did end up doing that and adding on the, the eye tracking glasses, um, which are, I would say, maybe in some ways more, more obvious. Um, the motion capture is just, you know, a black suit with little white dots on it, and you can see the cameras around the edge of the stage, but maybe that can blend in a little bit. But the eye trackers are pretty weird looking. And I think they were also a little a little bit intrusive for you because if you're not used to wearing something that has cameras just where you should be looking at the score, then you need to adapt to that on the spot. Um, so I, yeah, I think um, some of these things we we kind of presented an idea of the most um, the most things that we could measure, and you were in on it. You were agree. <laughs> you, you were willing to do this, and so we we went with it. Um, and I guess based on what some of the people from the audience um, said, they maybe for some of them that was a little too much actually, and I guess it it, it raises some questions about why why science um, is so different from art, why these things need to be so so separate, why it's now detracting from a, an experience of beautiful music if somebody is wearing wearing technology or if there are cameras around. And that, um, probably this is because this is how we are used to experiencing music, and especially in the classical tradition, and you go to these beautiful halls and they have lovely ornate things and the musicians dress in a certain way and perhaps if, if people had more opportunities to see everything pushed together then they would be also interested in the science and as well as appreciating the music. Thank you. Well, um, I, it's a little two-parter. I think um, first of all we, we definitely wanted the whole uh, flashy outfit, um, absolutely, because we thought it would be really fun, um, and we always like challenging stuff. I mean, if I can make a small comparison, uh, then when we're talking about music, and, and if we if we tell an audience that you're gonna listen to a piece by Haydn, then most of them know what it sounds like, and most of them think what they know what they think of it already, and the same if you tell them they're they're gonna hear a piece by Schnitke then they know that what it sounds like and they know that they don't like it, probably, right? Um, but if you don't tell them and you sneak it in here and there or you, you play a movement by Haydn and followed by a slow movement by Schnittke that it is inspired by Renaissance music, then they don't really know what it is and then sometimes they actually, you can make them like it without them noticing and then afterwards you tell them and they'll be like, no, that can, could not have been Schnittke. Um, so that was maybe a little bit the idea with this as well. We we wanted to see if the science of it could be become an aesthetic part of the concert. Uh, we talked about like bubbly liquids as well on stage, <laughs> but at some point even Simon was like, "No, not gonna do that." <laughs> um, but there was one other thing that I that I that I thought of now uh, in in regards of how intrusive things are. And we've, we've talked about how intrusive it were in, uh, reg in regards to the audience. But, um, but I remember that was you, w you traveled with us, Simon, uh, in California for a while uh, on a tour that we had. And you, you brought these little heart measuring devices, uh, like invisible from outside. Uh, but we spent some five minutes before co each country putting them up and, and starting the, the s sequence or whatever. I don't know. It's not a countdown, but um, um, and then the, the we had a conversation after we were supposed to have a conversation after about how uh, you know uh, how how much we were into the music at a given point in time and and you know it was much it was a lot about this being in in a right flow uh, conversations that we were talking about and just by having these things on my chest, it changed the way that I uh, felt the flow. Um, I, I, was, I remember I was sitting there and I felt those things and I thought, they're measuring my heart. What is it doing? What is, it, what, is it, what is my heart doing? And I also thought, oh, I better hurry and get into a really nice flow so I can tell Simon about it afterwards. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then it's not going to happen. <laughs> 
right? So there, there's these, th 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 those are also some challenges, I think, that are um, that worth mentioning. Yeah. yeah, these are good points. And um, moving to, to the audience then, because that was also quite no intrusive. I mean, uh, I guess, Finn, you were mainly involved in this Music Lab app and the phones hanging on the chest and, and uh, tapping and uh, questionnaires and all these things. So, so what's your, your opinion about this kind of uh, having the audience to go through all of this and uh, yeah. what we can get out of it? I mean, there, there's two kind of um, angles to it. Uh, one is that uh, asking audience members to do something changes their role in a way that's very it's explicit and, and it's kind of unavoidable as a disruption. At the same time, um, it wasn't as disruptive as you thought it would be. <laughs> One of the questions that we included in the questionnaire was how aware they were of their bodies during this context of being measured. And uh, what we found is that there wasn't a systematic effect, at the very least, of being measured to what we were measuring. So people that were more aware or less aware didn't seem to move less or more. That, and that was a really helpful thing to actually include in our methodology to just, and it's, I mean, it's not to say that there was no impact, because there, there, I'm sure there was, but at least it wasn't so lasting as to change the kind of, the, the statistics that we were using to understand what was going on. So um, I, I don't mean to say that we can get away with this always, but <laughs> I think there is context in which we can at least be careful about how disruptive it is. Um, and I also wonder, Given that, uh, particularly in classical music, it's such an extreme in terms of not having an audience participate, whether we might, in, with these kinds of systems of asking people to tap on their phones or whatever before the concert, whether that can actually invite a different kind of engagement from them in allowing them to acknowledge themselves. And uh, an another surprising thing to come from their self-report was how little they were aware of each other over the course of these performances. And they, they barely noticed each other consciously, whether or not, I mean, obviously there'd be influences kind of despite that. Um, but in allowing them to recognize the audience as part of their experience, that might actually transform how they appreciate the experience of going to a concert and being part of that face-to-face -face crowd. Um, I think for some people, going to a good concert isn't that different from listening to a good album, studio recording. But for many others, it is quite important. And we can, we can get at that with this little danger of interference. Um, but, it, I mean it, but it does need to be handled. Um, and we can't take it for granted. Yeah. Uh, just before I say what I'm supposed to say in regards to what you said, I just want to also mention my other colleague, which is Rebecca. And uh, she... Yeah, she uh, she did uh, a lot about the uh, legal things also relating to, to audience and GDPR and everything. But I wanted to say that I think that uh, we are for better or worse uh, people in general becoming desensitized both to, I mean, being on camera and also giving off data, which we do all the time. That could actually help in uh, in research. That could be a good thing. Also for, uh, for musicians, because now we are going to collaborate with the uh, Norwegian Radio Orchestra. They are already desensitized to cameras, of course, because they're on TV all the time. But um, maybe it would help to, to wear this uh, kind of uh, technology a lot. And then you will maybe start getting into the flow even though you're, <laughs> you're wearing it. And also, one more thing, I think there is a lot of potential in the direction of citizen science. Because we keep saying our oh, citizen science, but actually we are only doing parts of what is citizen science. We need to really involve audience more in all the processes. Uh, including, you know, uh, formulating questions. Maybe I'm deviating a bit here, but just want, yeah. Uh, formulating the questions and also having a more active role in interpreting things later on. I mean, we have done some things like hack labs and we have communicated a lot, but we are still not communicating enough and not involving enough. But I think that will maybe happen in the next events, uh, specifically the one with the Norwegian Radio Orchestra, where we are collaborating also with uh, uh, a very popular um, popular science program and people have sent really interesting questions which should not be underestimated you know including um, okay music among animals prenatal music experiences musical induction of trance music as an aphrodisiac and grunting pianists and some of these things maybe are outside the scope or ritmo or some of them are already heavily researched I don't know but I still feel like people will feel 
more excited about the research if they're involved, if, they're, if their questions are being heard. And I also, one last thing is that I had them um, in the Ultima Festival, I was having a lot of panel conversations. I'm, I'm usually in that chair in, um, in radio and, uh, and, and people were having so much valuable insights. There were pal panel conversations with listeners um, who had been to different concerts and they had so many interesting things to say about their experiences. So that's the value, I guess, of an uh, uh, open focus group, which I think we can also explore more in, uh, in coming events. Yeah, sorry if I deviated a bit much. Yeah. Just a, one tiny comment, which is, of course, that audiences are not homogenous and have not been homogenous. So audiences change. What audiences are expected to do, feel, believe, and behave has changed historically. And if one looks at, for instance, non-Western con concert contexts, an, uh, an audience, a North Indian audience in a North Indian performance is incredible. They're more like a football crowd. Uh, incredibly active and interactive. Um, a, an audience at a Wayan Kulit, Balinese shadow puppet, will wander around behind the stage. You should wander about and talk and eat and stuff. So what audiences are and what audiences do changes and normalizes. So it might be that the iPhone worn around the neck or wherever becomes normal. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> and, and also people can learn to become le better listeners as well. Like one of the things that they spoke about was how to make yourself more available to the experience. I think that's also something, I mean, you would, you'd be priming them, of course, but maybe you'd get something interesting from that as well. Uh, one of the listeners I spoke with um, spoke about how to notice his body, his, how, the, how the temperature of the light, with, and then he became very sensitive to the music. And also, um, musicians can also learn to get into flow states. I mean, there, there are techniques for getting into that. So, yeah. So one other tiny point, which is that there's some stuff I suspect we're just not going to know. I'm thinking in particular of two concerts in Cambridge, St. Matthew Passion, King's College, King's College Choir, the Academy of Ancient Music, fabulous soloists. I went along to one as a kind of duty. We got tickets, we were given tickets, we were invited to reception. Oh, right, then another one. Within 11 seconds, it was, oh, yes. And f that was it. It was just fabulous. Three years later, exactly the same forces, same location, everything. It's all right. It was good. You know, but you can't predict. You can't build it in. I think it's time to open for some questions and comments from the audience as well. And uh, there is also one question in the in the chat from uh, Lars Ole Bonde, uh, and he's coming to this from the field of music and health. And uh, he writes, "My hypothesis would be that musical absorption is health promoting." I wonder if you discuss this aspect in any of the papers. Um, and. Um, I guess we are not really, but uh, any thoughts on uh, on the health aspects also of, of this? Well, first comment is not specifically being talking about health, it uses a term, certainly in papers I'm involved in, but we started in uh, one of the papers on musical absorption, using the questionnaire as the primary data, to, to think about things like transformation. <laughs> we asked about, do you feel negatively kind of transformed or positively transformed? That's a very a uh, small step towards comments about self-awareness, balance, um, a sense of being altered in some way that clearly has, when we say positive, we're not just meaning like cognitive in, or cognitive sense of this, we're talking about uh, lots of ways that music can feel, uh, make you feel transformed in some way. So, uh, n no, in the papers, I can go only on these, I'm, I'm involved in, but not health as such, but we're trying to hint at some of these affective possibilities, potentials that we know, and there's lots of research in other fields, particularly around music therapy, where we can say these things about it. Yeah, I'll pass the microphone. Um, yeah, w again, th this wasn't an angle that we were deliberately assessing, but when we are uh, exp we're trying to understand people's bodies, it is related to health. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm learning in the process of starting to work more with musician measurements is just how physically <laughs> demanding this work is. Um, and uh, audience members don't need to think about this necessarily, but the musician body is one that's incredibly active uh, and needs to be prepared and you know, has to be sustained through this kind of work. Uh, and so recognizing how that interaction of the kind of the, the mental states that people are in that allow them to actually perform these physical feats, that's a really interesting thing. 
Um, and then to see this relationship, these physical relationships between the audience and the performers, this opens up this idea of how an audience can benefit from that work. <laughs> you know, you're sweating for someone. Um, and uh, the way in which, uh, or one of the surprising things was that we managed to measure essentially people's heart rates in the audience just by having their phone on their chest, which was not what we were trying to do. Um, but they looked pretty healthy, actually, as a distribution, given their ages. So. <laughs> Bravo, this particular uh, community. Um, but what is interesting is that most of them were kind of at this resting heart rate um, for, you know, or at least that's what it looked like from, from what we're seeing here. We don't have direct comparisons individually. But anyway, but what this is uh, granting people in the context of going to a concert like this is this uh, a rewarding, sustained state of stillness that isn't always possible. I mean, kind of, when else are you allowed to sit like this? You have to kind of construct an environment in which to attend and engage and be in this kind of state. And so, I, mean, I think we can be thinking about the value, uh, the hell value of these kinds of moments physically. It's not just, you know, being still, but being still with other people, which I think is one of the critical things, because when does that happen? Great. Let's open for some I'm some happy questions. to run with a microphone. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, no, I can, I can take okay. microphones. You can answer. <laughs> <laughs> Always good service. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. This has been, you've all made excellent points. I'm really overwhelmed by all this, this knowledge uh, flowing towards me. Also from you, Frederik, everyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, so I... I know we so some of us are going to talk a little bit about this um, tomorrow also but but like I would like to um see like in, invite you to to think about if 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 we had this panel in in 10 years where would concert research be you know where where is it where is it going what are the new things we can uh, achieve you know maybe what are the challenges you know what whatever approach you want to take to it but just kind of try to speculate a little bit about what are the next steps and um, and so on so one of the things I hope to see is that technology will have evolved um, developed to a level where it's now not just possible to do this kind of research but a lot easier um, so this, what we captured here, um, required a, an enormous amount of work, both to set up, also in advance to, to test how things would work. We ran an entire concert experiment in the lab to see how things would work. And on top of that, an enormous amount of work afterwards to deal with the very noisy data that we got. And particularly in situations where we, we want to capture um, large-scale collective data. So this, a large audience like this, or bigger, we've got these experiments going on, on now with the orchestra. And when you go from trying to equip four musicians with devices to 57 or so, um, it requires now a lot, a lot of time and a lot of more, but there's more potential for disrupting the performance because now you have to choreograph kind of synchronization steps and all of these sorts of things. So I would say this is one thing that I, I hope will become a lot easier, that you can really have technologies that are easy to set up for large numbers of people and that are designed to capture, are capable of capturing music performance in an unobtrusive way. And so that also means um, technologies that can record data for the entire length of a concert rather than some of the things that we are using where they're, they are designed to capture five minutes at a time. That doesn't work for a, for a concert. Um, if, if I may, um, sure. I think one thing that I would like to see in 10 years is for this kind of research to be seen as normal and important for society. Um, and that, you know, the results from this kind of work and, and other similar studies should be building uh, an argument for uh, these kinds of events and for the value of music. And, uh, you know, we're, we are accumulating a lot of really good information. And at some point, I would love it for an audience to be like, oh, this is another one of those science concerts. Okay. <laughs> and, and let us... Uh, continue to appreciate and recognize the value of collective kind of events like this. Um, 
And that's not going to happen out of nothing. Uh, you know, the work of publicizing these kinds of events and connecting with the public is really important for making that possible. But I think that is uh, in 10 years. I would like this to be less of an event, but a lot easier <laughs> for everyone involved. Yeah. If I could uh, also, um, we also need to remind everyone that uh, all the data also that we captured is already available online. Uh, a lot of it uh, is openly available. Some of it, unfortunately, is not openly available due to copyright and privacy uh, issues. But uh, we have tried to make yeah. as much as possible available. And that also opens for exploring this in many, many new ways, because, I mean, we've published, uh, or we will have like 12 papers or so coming out of this, and perhaps more in the future, but again, many, many other people can hopefully also benefit from this material and use it in different ways that can also inspire new research in the in the years to come. But then, thinking about this, also the kind of the, the connecting to the world outside of academia, uh, if you like, the wild, <laughs> what you would call it. We, um, then also, Sula, I mean, you, you have experience uh, working at the library uh, for these things, but also in radio and also kind of in the, the kind of communication, in large scale um, communication for these things. And, and uh, talking about also having people out there engage uh, and learn and be interested in this type of research. Um, what do you see as the future also in kind of in this bridging between uh, academia and, and uh, the combination of, of citizen science and research dissemination and communication? It's really a tricky question. Um, I think it needs to be communicated much more clearly why it's important. Because I think that you all know why you think it's important. And, uh, and have your own jargon and it's just like, but I am yet to experience one very, very clear sentence that says, why exactly is it important for the world? You know? So I think that's one thing. And then just uh, teaching people what, what is the whole science of uh, the whole uh, project of uh, research, that it be can, can become a very normal thing to do. Like today, I'm giving off some data and I'm getting some free art in return. It's just like, it would be really nice if, uh, if it's possible to create these kinds of, um, of habits. So I don't have a better answer than that right now. <laughs> One issue, one issue in this goes to something that an American um, ac a journalist and academic came up with last year, the notion of the death of expertise. That there is an increasing mistrust or distrust of the expert, the scientist. And outreach in this respect is absolutely critical. One has to do science yeah, in the wild. You'd be, you're going to be out there saying, I'm doing this and it's this and I'm doing it because. And yeah, we have to, to justify. Just a couple of days ago, I was involved in a, uh, an experiment we were doing in the Science Museum in London, where we were getting just um, this project that worked out called Sing with a Stranger. So I just want to find out when two people sing together, what happens? If you have not prepared, if you are not expert, if you just think of a group of people singing Happy Birthday, you wouldn't want to listen to it, but you'll do it, and you'll feel good about having done it. So. How, f how far apart from each other can people be and you still feel good about it? I don't know. So let's do an experiment. We did the experiment and we got quite a lot of immediate feedback, questionnaire feedback, to the ex just people saying, oh, I didn't realize it was so easy to feel connected with someone just by singing with them. So that was one of the, oh, we just won that one. Occasionally one gets um, opportunities to interact in ways that elucidates why it is what you're doing through doing what you're doing. And that we need just more of that. I think that also communicating to lay people is a very good exercise for people that when, when uh, like, I mean, you're saying, I don't know, but you're saying that you still need to communicate better because you come from different disciplines. I mean, one very good thing is then to communicate externally to somebody who doesn't understand. And then maybe an effect of that would be to, uh, to have a clearer understanding between you as well, I don't know. Um, yeah. Well, we have a couple of things on our side as well, in our favor here. One is that what you do, Frederick, we are fascinated by it. Not, I don't mean academically, I mean, people are fascinated with what musicians do. This magic you talk about, this mystical wonder of it is not lost. It still isn't lost by our research, I don't think. I hope not, for goodness sake, I hope not. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we need to leave, you know, and do something else. So we have that on our side. It's an incredible uh, privilege we have of music researchers that people are fascinated by it. 
People are fascinated by hearing what musicians say about their own practice, and I think we would not have too much trouble recruiting people to get a kind of sense of closeness to what you do. The insights we get from a concert experiment where you're rigged up, you're performing in this real setting, for people is a wondrous opportunity to get inside this magic of what you achieve. I don't think we're going to struggle in that sense. If this becomes more normal, is what I say about how easier to do, it will not be a challenge to get somebody. Do you want to find out what your favorite musician feels and does? Sign me up. How much do I need to pay? You know. Yeah. Um, the second thing is that people love talking about music. We must underestimate this. I mean, in experimental settings, it's difficult. As we said, like these kind of phenomenological interviews that I do, as soon as you ask someone to talk about music, they go, oh. But anywhere else outside of that, people are quite willing. They want to. I'm thinking about kind of family and friends who want to speak about it. We just have to find ways, as you say, that say this is what you get from it. You'll get an insight that you perhaps didn't have about a thing you many, many people love. And the final point is that on this concert research thing, we, we I hope, have um, better ways to think about the so what question. Why does it matter? Not just what's happening, uh, whether that's physiologically or in terms of absorption, but why on earth does that matter? We kind of know, don't we? But we need to show it and think about it like that as well. So the so what needs to be a part of these big experiments as much as the what. And then the, the so what, Frederick, is uh, <laughs> what about... Would, would you do it again? And, and what would be... Would, would, what are you interested in then learning from perhaps future research on you and uh, colleagues? <laughs> um, well, I, w um, I, was, I was talking to Simon before this, um, and um, I just finished reading uh, The Brothers Lionheart uh, by Astrid Lindgren to my two, uh, to my two little boys back home, they're four and six. And we started reading it in the morning because it's too scary to read it as a nighttime story. Um, uh, but so I, I found myself this one morning at the breakfast table with the two boys. And I, was, I, I started the last page and by then I knew okay, this is not gonna go well. I just felt like, oh no, oh no, oh no. And uh, it, it totally happened, like I, I, at some point I started crying <laughs> during breakfast, during the oatmeal and everything. My wife comes in, she's like, what's going on? And then she hears like me reading the story and she starts, starts to cry. <laughs> and the two little kids, they sit there, what's going on <laughs> like with our parents? <laughs> But I mean, this is that's 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 both the magic of art, but it's also because she was an incredible writer, right? It's also technique, and and skill, and I think this that 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 that's, that duet <laughs> uh, needs to be really examined because the, the, that's what everybody needs. That's what the world needs, and the more we can have, the better. Uh, I, like I said before, I think the, um, the 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 more we know about this, um, the 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 I don't think the magic will disappear. I think we'll get more of it. It can be an aspect of the of the magic as well. And back to what you said, I mean, people are very excited to see their their data curves, you know, when they have it shared and, and that's what we have experienced over and over again. Like, oh, did we align? Did our hearts align? <laughs> you know, like they they have these questions. So I think that's that's beautiful to um, to investigate more and that maybe I've also a better answer to what you asked me earlier. Um, I also wanted to say that your what you said about uh, knowledge always being provisional. There is this huge uh, star, uh, Venke Myra, the Norwegians know her. She's been on stage for seven decades. And she said, you have to always, you have to have a goal, but you should never get there. And then, I mean, she never quite gets there, but she gets in so, to so many places on the way, and that's kept her going for 70 years. That's much more than your 40 years, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and also the saying that, I can't remember the attribution, but like, uh, follow the person who seeks truth, but run away if he finds it. So. Well, perhaps that's a good place to end. Uh, I think uh, we are out of time, but we can continue the conversation outside uh, at the reception. So thanks a lot to the panel and uh, thanks a lot to, uh, to the people physically here and to everyone out there in the world. And uh, please do go and look at the articles that are published in this special collection of music and science. And thank you for today. <laughs>